Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's meeting of the Council of the United Counties of Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry, today being Monday, January 16th. Madam Clerk. It's moved by Councillor Densham, seconded by Councillor Bergeron, that the meeting of the Council of the United Counties of Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry be hereby called to order. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. Uh, before we uh, go into adoption of the agenda, uh, we have a member at the table that needs introduction to some of us, but not to all of us. I'd like to welcome uh, Councillor Jeff Manley from North Glengarry, who's uh, filling in for Councillor Mr. Jamie McDonald. Mr. Manley is the alternate county councillor sitting in for North Glengarry, and welcome. Madam Clerk, adoption of the agenda. It's moved by Councillor Bergeron, seconded by Councillor Broad, that Council approve the agenda. All those in favor? Opposed, seeing none, it's carried. Is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest or general nature thereof? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, the adoption of the minutes. It's moved by Councillor Bergeron, seconded by Councillor Densham, that the minutes of the meeting, including the in-camera minutes of the Council of the United Counties of Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry, held December 19th, 2022, be adopted as circulated. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. Today we have four delegations. One will jo be joining us uh, via Zoom. I see they're up on the screen now. Uh, our first delegation is uh, about the Ronald McDonald House Charities from Ottawa and Christine Hardy, the Chief Executive Officer, will be doing the presentation. Welcome. Ottawa, and I'm here together with our campaign director, Cynthia Little. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we're just having um, some trouble. Uh, uh, excuse okay. me. We're just having trouble with your audio, or at least I am. Okay. I'll plug in my headset and see if that's better. Are you able to hear Cynthia okay? Good morning. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, is it best if I share my screen or would you prefer to put up the presentation? Please share it. Pardon me? Sorry. Well, if you would share yours. Is this better? Is this better? How's this? Is that good? Okay, great. I see some thumbs up. Thank you. Okay, thank you all so, so much for welcoming us back today. Uh, we are thrilled. It has been a very busy year. Now, I know um, there are some new members of, cancels, of council, so I'll begin the presentation again. Um, but for those of you who heard us speak last year, there have been quite a few changes or quite a few developments in the, in the last year that we're excited to share with you. So as... Um, as some of you will know, last year we presented to the counties of SDG and we were so grateful to receive a gift of $50,000 towards our capital campaign. There was quite a bit of discussion around a multi-year pledge. However, with the elections coming, we, um, I believe council decided just to give a $50,000 contribution and that we would have this discussion again, perhaps this year. So that's what brings us back today. 65% of children live outside or families live outside of a city that's home to a children's hospital. So what this means is that for most families and for certainly for all the families in your neighborhoods, um, they're required to travel when their child becomes ill or injured. 65%. So most families have to travel if they need to use a children's hospital. You can imagine the logistics of this and imagine the cost. Oftentimes what happens is mom will have to quit her job 
in order to be by the child's side or one parent if they're fortunate enough to have two while the other parent stays home to continue working, to continue paying the bills and caring for other children. Ultimately, the family gets divided and that's where Ronald McDonald House comes in. We give families a home away from home where they can meet up on weekends, stay, parents can stay and get a good night's sleep outside of the hospital and families can come together whenever it's possible. For those of you who haven't been, this is the outside of Ronald McDonald House. We're located just 167 steps away from Chio's front door. We are enclosed with uh, some beautiful old trees. We're quite well hidden and we're really designed to look and feel like a home. The cost to operate one of our rooms per night is about $100. We charge families 10. That's only if they can afford it. If not, we waive the cost. We have 14 rooms. We were built this way nearly 40, nearly 40 years ago in 1984. We were one of the original five houses in Canada, Ronald McDonald houses. They're now 16 and we've been the same size for, four, for 40 years. We've never grown and in the meantime, we've operated with a very long wait list, especially in recent years. When you walk into a Ronald McDonald house, you get a warm, loving welcome from our staff and our volunteers. We, you get a private suite, a private bathroom. We have shared kitchen areas. We have a meal program so that after spending long days at the hospital, you don't have to worry about what you'll feed yourself and your other children. We welcome siblings, of course. Um, pet therapy, music therapy, everything we can do to make it comfortable while also providing the opportunity to connect with other families who truly appreciate what you're going through. The only criteria to stay with us is that you live more than 80 kilometers away. So actually our largest group of families comes from your area and uh, there are no, there's no other criteria. You just have to live too far away to be able to commute back and forth while your child is sick. And I'll hand it over to Cynthia. Thank you, Christine. So since 1984, Ron McDonald House has welcomed over 228 families from your from your communities for a total of over 10,000 nights of comfort. And that's saved families over $3 million in expenses that otherwise would have come out of their pockets. And that includes the family that you see in the picture here right now from, <clears throat> pardon me, from Maxwell, um, from Maxwell, Bill. Um, this is the Cole family. Family members are Greg was the dad, Rob and his mom, and Jesse was six years old during, di uh, during his diagnosis. And sadly, uh, Jesse passed away in February of 2021. But in 2018, Jesse was a vibrant six-year-old who loved nothing more than just being active, but he noticed that trips um, to and from school bus were becoming really a, a challenge. He had uh, numbness in his leg and constant need to run to the washroom. He was getting really frustrated and uh, things just didn't feel right. And Greg and his wife, Robin, were starting to get concerned. So trips to and from the emergency room and local doctors came up short, doctors ran tests, they took scans and continuously repeated that Jesse had a, a waste blockage that would, um, that would pass naturally. What, um, what they were actually really seeing in the scans was a tumor and this tumor really uprooted the Coles family lives for years to come. And so the clinical teams were at CHEO gathered to share the diagnosis with Greg and Robin and four months of sleeping at Jesse's bedside and living out of their vehicle would, would actually soon follow. Greg was eventually moved next door to Rotel, that's next door to, um, to Chio and to Ronald McDonald House and separated the families further during a time when they needed each other most. But Greg was determined to find space where his family could comfortably be together. And Greg walked over to Ronald McDonald House and desperate for help but he remembers vividly the warm, how can I help you, sweetheart, he received and the flood of relief when he learned that the room was available where he and his family could be together. Greg admits that um, it, was, it took some time to get used to the idea of communal living. Staff were helpful, but um, he was adamant that he was just gonna keep to himself. And that was until another family from Cornwall joined the Coles at the house, the bond between the two families, families that similar challenges, the way the, the um, changed the way that Greg looked at uh, Ronald McDonald House and began uh, to forge a wonderful friendship. The, um, the Cole family came to our house at the beginning of COVID 
and made Ronald McDonald House their home during birthdays and holidays and more. And sadly, after 478 days at our house, the family was moved to Roger Nielsen House across the street where Jesse passed away in February of 2021. So as Christine was saying, we're located only 160 steps away from Ronald McDonald House, as you see where the circle is and where it's hidden behind those trees. Um, <laughs> and it's large enough. The good news is, though, that our parcel of land is large enough to accommodate our critical growth as well as our additional parking needs. Chio is underway with their own plans to grow. So our house needs to grow as well to accommodate both the current and future demands of our service. And that takes us to our project. So the way we are structured as Ronald McDonald House, we're part of a global network. And the size that we're meant to be, to be is really determined by that global headquarters. So in, in Chicago. So what we do is we submit CHEO's patient projection data and based on an analysis of where CHEO is going, that determines our size. So we have 14 rooms and we were quite surprised to learn that we should actually have 36. We are adding 22 new bedrooms to our existing site. Our architects idea design, we call them magicians because we can't believe they were able to fit everything, all the 22 rooms, as well as all of our parking needs on our current parcel of land, which we lease from CHEO. The cost of the build is 22.7 million and we're adding 25,000 square feet. Here's our timeline. Now this has changed. Um, this is where I wanted to mention some of the advances. We received a federal grant of 9.37 million this year, which as you can imagine was uh, so exciting for us because it has really allowed us to keep to our timeline and to um, not, I mean, raising 9.37 million can take a number of years. So we're very grateful for that. We have all the approvals in place. We are with the federal grant is through Infrastructure Canada. We, um, we identified that we'd be breaking ground in April, which we are still doing. We are moving along very quickly. We're through detailed design. We have a project manager. We're in the process of hiring our construction manager. Once we break ground in April, um, it should take 14 months to build. So we'll be open at 36 rooms in the fall of 2024. Here's just a little bit more information about the grant. So again, 9.37 million. This was for, through the Green and Inclusive Buildings Program, which was an Infrastructure Canada grant that was announced in 2021. We submitted and then uh, about a year later, we heard that we had been successful. Um, I think, you know, we're, we're just so ready to go. All we needed was the funding, which, um, which really helped with our, our submission. Our, again, our design is complete. Uh, we have all our approvals from CHEO. We just need to raise the remaining funds. A little bit about a green and inclusive um, grant. So we, as part of the green and inclusive build, we'll be building to carbon neutral to net zero carbon. We're also going to be building to lead gold standard as well as Rick Hansen Foundation certified gold. It's tough to imagine that a Ronald McDonald house is not accessible, but we are, uh, we're embarrassed to say that we're not. We don't have an elevator. We have, uh, we have created some accessible space, but there is a long way to go from a building built in 1984 to become fully accessible. And as you can imagine, especially the kids who are going through cancer treatment, they're in so much pain that they often do commute back and forth in a wheelchair. So we are very eager to become fully accessible. So here are a few highlights of uh, the fundraising that we've done to date. As Christine mentioned, we received the 9.37 towards our project from, um, from the Federal Green and Inclusive Grant. Our board has been preparing for this for a long time and they've contributed uh, 4.5 million of our own funds. And our partners at CHEO are very um, supportive of us and um, they have contributed 500,000. And we've received strong support from other businesses and individuals in our community. And we are also preparing to launch a communication and marketing uh, campaign early, um, this year, very soon. And uh, it is official the public launch of our expansion, which we hope will inspire donors to either make or finalize their donations to us. And this, um, this is the final stretch 
our costs have increased and we need to stick to our timeline to, to break ground in April to adhere to the schedule we set out in our federal grant application. And so today our funding gap is four, sorry, 4.3 million and we have an ask in with the province to Ontario for 3.1 million and we anticipate receiving an answer very soon. And this would leave us with 1.2 million to raise. We have a very conservative cost estimator. We don't expect any further increases, particularly with plans to break ground in four months time. <laughs> We're ready to go. We just need the remaining funds. So our ask today is that, um, is that council would consider a four year pledge at the same amount that you generously gave to us last year, which would be 50,000 for the next four years to a total of 250,000. And we would look forward to, um, to recognizing that gift with, with a naming in perpetuity in a space within the house. And that concludes our presentation. I'd now like to open it up for questions. Christine, Cynthia, thank you very much for the presentation and uh, at your request, yeah, we'll open it up to uh, questions and comments from members of council. Councillor Lang. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and through you, thank you very much for the presentation, uh, ladies. Uh, very, very worthwhile thing, and, and I've never had to use it, and, and hopefully never will, or none of my family will, but I think it's so wonderful that it's there, and, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll chat about it around here, and I'm hopeful that we can uh, help you out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Councillor. Uh, any uh, further questions, comments for the, uh, the ladies? Seeing none, um, well, I want to thank you ladies for your presentation, um, and, I, and I'm sorry, I, I, I do know Christine's last name, but Cynthia, I, I, I missed it. Oh, Cynthia Little. Thank you so much for your time. So I, I want to thank you for uh, Ms. Hardy and Ms. Little for the presentation, and uh, we are in the, essentially in the midst of our budget uh, deliberations and we have lots of challenges in front of us and this is a challenge as well. So uh, careful consideration be given to, uh, to your uh, concerns and to your requests and I just want to thank you once again for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, thank so, you very so much. much. Our next delegation is the uh, from the Eastern Ontario Agri-Food Network, and uh, we have the Executive Director, Mr. Louis Ballon. Uh, please, come forward. That's the right button, perfect. Um, thank you very much uh, for your time. Uh, tough delegation to follow, honestly. Um, I will jump right into it and, uh, and hopefully not take up too much of your time. I do want to, to thank um, everyone here and the staff at the counties who are an absolute joy to work with, honestly. Um, so for those, uh, for those who are new around the table, um, my predecessor, Tom Manley, would have done these, uh, these presentations in the past. Uh, hopefully I'm up to par, but I will go over a little bit of what the Agri-Food Network is uh, so everyone's on the same page. Uh, we are a nonprofit that covers most of Eastern Ontario um, working in the agri-food sector. Um, I am a, a bit of a perspective guy, so to, to put that nationally on, on the national scale, uh, agri-food sector does represent about $134 billion in 2021 and employs one in nine people in Canada. Um, so it is a very important sector that's just under 7% of the GDP in, uh, in 2021. Um, what we do here in Eastern Ontario is directly support uh, those small businesses, uh, small local producers operating in that sector. Uh, mostly with, with uh, three kind of focus areas. So marketing, uh, obviously those connections between uh, small producers that you know, are busy running their, their businesses, 
uh, getting their names out in front of people and making those connections with consumers, building those relationships. We, we help support that. Uh, we do a lot of capacity building for them, so direct, uh, direct business support. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur myself, so a lot of that comes from my uh, coaching background. Uh, so I offer direct support to them. And we do uh, tackle some um, regional issues in terms of advocacy and, and representations. Um, the biggest one that's going to be uh, on the agenda for the next year or so will be distribution, uh, which is a very uh, significant challenge for most of our uh, local producers. Um, I do have internal operations on there because it is something we've been working on quite a bit uh, over the past couple of years. Uh, a lot of changes and a lot of uh, significant progress in terms of efficiency and impact uh, internally. So our objective today, uh, my ask, we've, uh, we've uh, generously received uh, some funding in the past two years from uh, SDG counties and uh, we are looking to, to continue this uh, three-year agreement, so renewing this for, for 2023. Um, you know, I, I did mention the, the, the staff at the counties is a joy to work with, uh, Tara as well. Um, you know, I absolutely love um, all our interactions and our work together. Another bit of perspective, um, just to s for, for everyone to see the impact that we do have. Um, we are sitting at 190 members total across Eastern Ontario. Uh, they vary in, in, in scale and size, uh, but 65 are current members uh, in SDG specifically. Uh, I do have a short list there. Obviously, it's not all of them, but um, hopefully you'll recognize a few of those names. And as I mentioned, in terms of perspective uh, from that funding, we are looking at about $385 per member in a year, and that comes out to 22 cents per resident in the counties here. Um, so most of our um, most of our requests from from different councils, we do get. Uh, I, I do go over it in the next slide, but we do get uh, some funding from uh, from Cornwall and from Prescott Russell as well. Uh, and these these requests and expectations from councils are are are, are pretty standard. So I do I do speak to uh, all seventy of these points uh, very quickly. Um, so, in terms of accountability and governance, uh, since we've started receiving funding from um, municipalities, we did review all our bylaws, they're all up to code, they're all updated. Uh, we do have uh, four permanent board seats for uh, municipalities, so uh, Prescott Russell, um, Cornwall, SDG and Aquasasne. Uh, we do provide governance trading to new directors and, and obviously those four seats have a significant role in budget reviews and, and, and whatnot. Um, in terms of uh, financial leverage, uh, our municipal contributions uh, amount to $90,000 total per year. Um, so you see proportions there uh, and funding that we get from other municipalities. Um, most of that funding goes towards operations. And we use that, uh, that funding to leverage other grants. Obviously, a lot of other grants, as you know, uh, require some portion of funding to come internally, and that's where we can leverage um, those sums. Over the past two years, we've received 94000 and change from OMAFRA, a place to grow grant, uh, which allowed uh, many, many projects to come to fruition, which I'll speak to in a bit. And uh, we just received uh, some funding, again, uh, leveraging this core uh, municipal funding that we get for Program uh, d'appui la la francophonie ontarienne for fifty thousand dollars and a Desjardins grant for another twenty five that we are currently running on for uh, projects that I will speak to. In terms of engagement, you can see a few stats here. So as I mentioned, one hundred and ninety um, registered uh, members and active. Um, a bit more internal funding, we do get about uh, just under 20000 from from those membership uh, fees and whatnot, and other program that we, we, we do run a few programs that we charge nominal fees for, so that represents another $8,000. Um, we're sitting just above 1,600 Facebook followers, 308 Instagram followers, which is growing quite rapidly uh, currently, and our newsletter is actually... Um, I was quite surprised when I joined uh, the network uh, seeing these numbers because I'm, I'm used to seeing newsletter um, readership sitting at about 15 to 20% um, open rate where uh, the network sits between 40 and 60 uh, consistently. Um, 
stats are a little bit behind. I took these early December, but in terms of website visits, we're looking at uh, just over 27,000, so a very active website as well. In terms of impact, these are a few of the, uh, of the projects that were run in the past couple years and some continue to run. So the local food map, we're sitting at 78 vendors, so that's a, uh, that's a map that sits on our website. Uh, this is evolving into uh, the new brand, which you see the stickers in front of you. That's the new brand we're going to that's consumer focused. Um, so the food map is going to evolve into more an integral part of our website, uh, not, as, not as a distinct function, but as a, uh, more of a, a consistent part of it. The food discovery booklet was 20 vendors, so it was a little booklet that was shared and, and, and consumers could go into these businesses and stamp and get, uh, get a rebate and a bit of a loyalty program, which has seen some success. Uh, that program is complete and will evolve into a coupon book in the next year or so. Um, Sample the East, they were our, our itineraries, a huge, huge, huge success and a big, a big part of where the new brand is going is those itineraries and the tourism piece. Uh, so we have 10 uh, itineraries, 10 routes um, across eastern Ontario and they're all seasonal. So some of them are, are winter focused, some of them are summer focused and, and whatnot. Uh, we did launch a local food portal which was a, uh, a online store for our, uh, for our members uh, that did not see as much success, uh, mostly because of timing uh, with COVID hitting, a lot of these businesses scrambled quite quickly to set up their own online storefront, uh, and so um, didn't quite hit the numbers. So we are evolving that partnership uh, to offer a, um, a much more advantageous uh, solution to our members that will want to, but it's not uh, an imposed uh, program. In terms of collaboration, I mean, a, a lot of this stuff is, is ongoing. Uh, Cornwall Waterfront Market is a, big, uh, is a big one here, and we did a lot of sponsorship for different, uh, different agri-food uh, events uh, throughout the year, uh, and those continue. We, we support them in any way we can. Sometimes it's, it's, it's a small sponsorship, and sometimes it's, it's a sponsorship more in, in advertising and, and services rendered. Uh, and in terms of sector representation, uh, quite a few presentations were, uh, were done. Uh, the, we're a big part of the International Culinary Channel, which is a partnership between um, Eastern Ontario, uh, Western Quebec, uh, Vermont, and New York. And we're looking at options to create a international trail. It would be the first of its kind worldwide. Um, and this project is, is, is moving forward quite quickly. Uh, and uh, part of that partnership, part of that uh, representation was a presentation that I did at the International Agritourism Conference in Vermont uh, in the fall. Um, you're all familiar with OEMC as well. We presented the, uh, the work we're doing with a new local food brand. Um, and in the coming year, we'll have uh, advisory committees uh, set up per sector. Uh, for small businesses, so we're looking at you know five or six, uh, five or six of our members sitting together and tackling larger, uh, larger sector issues. Um, in terms of sustainability, uh, we did go through strategic planning in the last uh, last couple of years. Uh, that's being implemented as we speak. Um, uh, again, a CRM, uh, internal systems uh, to 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 improve efficiency and whatnot. That's all moving forward. Uh, we're looking at you know, stable staffing and, and, and financial systems. And our board of directors is absolutely uh, phenomenal as, uh, as, as Karma Williams can speak to. Um, we have a great board of directors, uh, very engaged um, and, and uh, yeah. So where we're going uh, in the next uh, year um, is, uh, Continue the implementation of the strategic plan. So we're we're going with uh, with with uh, IT uh, system for for managing our members and for managing all our marketing campaigns. Um, there's a big project that that's in the works uh, that I'm trying to get funded through Trillium for for tackling the distribution issue. So um, you know a lot of a lot of these small producers um, they are low on staff, they are low on time. They have their their biggest sellers are, are farmers markets and, and events like that but there's other distribution channels that they're trying to get to that they just don't have the resource to tackle. So uh, we're a fairly large region geographically and, and, um, and the consumers are spread out. So how, how do we get their, their products in more consumers' hands? Um, 
the new local food brand, which you see uh, on those stickers, Savor East Ontario, uh, the goal of that was to, um, to, to, to clearly identify all the consumer-focused projects that the network has. So currently, Eastern Ontario Food Network, Agri-Food Network, is a very member-focused brand. Uh, this new brand is really consumer-focused, so it'll take all the, all the projects that we have that are consumer-focused, put it under one brand and make it very, very clear what kind of, um, what kind of offering we have and, and honestly richness that we have in Eastern Ontario. It is, the, it is one of the biggest sector, if not the biggest sector in Eastern Ontario. And, uh, and, and this brand will allow us to showcase the pride and, 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 and the richness we have here. Um, so that falls under a new website uh, that's being built. We'll launch uh, end of March at our AGM uh, and a rebuild of our agri-food network website as well. So instead of having everything under one website, one very busy website right now, it'll be split into two consumer-focused and member-focused, two identifiable and clearly cut brands. Um, and all that will trickle down into an increased public presence. Uh, you know, this, this brand will be consumer focused, so it will be in everyone's faces and it will get our producers in everyone's faces as well. So uh, we're looking at farmers markets, we're looking at all sorts of events. Um, we're looking at store shelves as well, um, displays. Uh, this is all a brand that, that our members will be able to use on their own products, increase awareness, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, the goal for the next year is to connect more consumers to more producers uh, via this new brand. It's about building those relationships, and that's what I'm, that's what I'm focused on. That's, what it, that's where all my experience is, is about those relationships between businesses and consumers. Um, we're looking at improved organizational efficiency and impact with the new membership structure, CRM, and uh, KPIs. So, there was a distinct lack of any kind of measurement in the past at the Agri-Food Network. Our new system will allow us to measure every single thing that we do um, in terms of impact, in terms of numbers. I will extend the invitation that if this council has any specific measurements that they want to see in the next year, please reach out to me. We can incorporate them into the new system and measure very specifically what you, uh, what you guys want to see and where, where the money goes. Um, and we will continue to support regional initiatives uh, that tackle shared obstacles, um, distribution being one of them, and our advisory committees will, uh, will identify uh, the other ones uh, per sector and continue to offer direct business support to local producers. That's about it. Um, I encourage you to keep, uh, keep following <laughs> This, uh, this new brand and, and, and what we're doing. We're having a official press conference uh, at one of our wonderful members here, ZipGrow, on January 24th. Um, it'll be, it's one of our usual networking uh, events. Everyone's invited and we're gonna do a, a nice, slightly more official launch of this new brand. Uh, and then the, uh, the website and whatnot will be released by our AGM at the end of March. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Uh, if you have any questions or if any questions following up, I'm also available by email or happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Milan, for that presentation. Um, and I will open it up to questions and comments from the floor. Councillor Williams. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, thanks for that presentation, Louis. Um, as Louis mentioned, I've been sitting on this board for the last couple of years, uh, starting when Tom Manley took it over. And the organization, as you can see, is very busy. It's doing uh, an awful lot of uh, things and has been in, in really, a, I think, a state of renewal for the last going into year number three. That renewal continues and I think is particularly Im important uh, for us to kind of keep that in mind when we're looking at the future of this organization and the part SDG uh, may, may be able to play in that. Um, uh, as, a, as a board member, uh, I was to kind of bring sort of what the main activities were to the board table. A lot of you are new, so you haven't had the benefit of that. Um, but I, I'm just wondering, Louis, whether you can just give a very brief overview of sort of 
where this organization came from and how you are really attempting for the first time to make it a truly regional organization, which it wasn't before. And, and there's value in that because we're stronger as a region than we yeah. are yeah, absolutely. individually. Um, founded in 2010, um, it was a very Prescott Russell focused organization with, with, you know, it's, it's, um, founding members and, uh, and champions very rooted in the Francophone Prescott Russell community. Uh, so it did start off as a very Francophone organization as well. Um, uh, and, and I mean, it, it went through its ups and downs as most, uh, most organizations do. Uh, but, but really the past few years have been, have been quite magical in a sense that I, I really see it as a, as a very, very logical, um, evolution in terms of a small, uh, nonprofit organization where, you know, you, you struggle to get twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 and it's all volunteer work by, by board members. Um, and in the past few years, Tom has done an absolutely phenomenal job in, in growing that and, and funding from, from the counties and, and the other municipalities are play a key role in that where it allows us to go get those those slightly larger grants and 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 get the ball rolling a little bit quicker and um and the next couple of years will be critical the way the way I see my role as well and and the reason I joined is is really to 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 take that next step in that evolution and make it very um self-sustaining and, and self-financing and and you know we're right now we're 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 sitting with grants and everything we're sitting at the two to fifty thousand dollar yearly um, yearly kind of wallet size uh, uh, on the financial side, and and the next step is is to grow that and and make sure that there's enough um, enough funding just generated by the organization to support uh, permanent staffing is where where I want to be to make sure those projects uh, keep rolling. So. Um, I mean, at this point in time, uh, municipal funding is quite critical. Um, but long term, that's the goal in reviewing the, the membership structure and, and the services offered is going to be to, to basically make it uh, self-sustaining. Huge, huge evolution in the past couple of years and, and the next uh, two, three years will continue that evolution for sure, but in a very, very positive way. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Uh, Councillor Densham. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and through you, um, I was actually, the, the, the part that sticks out to me is the fact that you're looking to, uh, to tackle the distribution challenges, and I think uh, that is, is, is key in my, uh, in my opinion, but could, would you mind just drilling down on that just one more notch to let, it, let us know, you know, what do you think are some of the key distribution challenges, and what are you hoping to, to achieve as you address that over the next couple of years? Well, I can speak to directly the project that I want to, to put forward. Um, we applied last year through the uh, local food innovation fund. Uh, we were not successful in that grant, but that was to tackle the the difference. Um, it was it was a Prescott Russell focused project in that particular case, but um, there's a huge gap between um, between food banks and grocery stores. Um, huge huge gap for for availability and 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 price, honestly. And so we were partnered with, um, oh, slip of the tongue here. Do you remember their name? Sorry, I apologize. Um, we had a partner in this where they, where they, sit, they sit in that gap uh, in terms of they, they buy wholesale and they sell at cost and it's an organization that is run by volunteers to provide food. Um, so it really sits between a, between a, a food bank and a grocery store. And the project was, uh, was the purchase of a refrigerated truck uh, to have a circuit that runs across all our smaller communities and, and offers that food for sale. So it would, it would sit for, um, for you know, a day in a community and then go do another community every day and, and, and have that kind of distribution piece that, that goes around. Um, you know, a lot of people can't get to food banks. Uh, they have transportation issues. They have all sorts of other challenges. And so my goal in the distribution piece was to kind of expand on that and, and not just offer that uh, by this one organization, but to offer it to all our producers and have a truck that's on the road uh, on a permanent basis uh, and have 
have routes that are run weekly and can pick up produce or, or products from from a list of producers and 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 just do that run and so so it'd be kind of an in and out in that truck where uh, our local local producers stock it and then they can stop in communities and sell it so it's 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 the starting piece it's like it's not an it's not a full complete uh, solution to such a difficult challenge but i think it's a it's a step forward in the right direction thank you councillor Further comments, questions for Mr. Bolan? Okay, seeing that there isn't. Uh, I just had a, a couple thoughts. Um, the summer focus day trips. I know at the counties we have uh, a bicycling map of different regions within uh, SDG and uh, to, to see different things, to go to different vendors, uh, businesses. Uh, has there been any, I'm looking for, I don't see Tara, has there been any, uh, I'm going to suggest that maybe a, a connection may be there uh, to include that on the, uh, the, the bicycling tour map if there's an opportunity to connect your members uh, with our map and uh, which would uh, be, I, I feel it would be advantageous. Yeah. Just my thought on that. Absolutely. Um, those partnerships are ongoing um, uh, with the counties here, with, with other organizations as well. I'm, I'm thinking the, the, uh, the Via Rail Trail in, in Prescott Russell as well. Um, these routes were done, uh, were done in the past year or so, uh, and they're not exclusive to members. So a lot of the stops on those, on those itineraries uh, are non-members uh, for the EON, but are better for the community. So absolutely, those those partnerships are ongoing, and and we'll we'll continue adding to those roads because they've had such a such a success. There's there's a huge demand uh, by the public for for day trips and itineraries like this. And you know, give me somewhere to go. I'll I'll go. I want to visit local. Just show me. Uh, and so there's definitely a demand for it. And uh, thank you for that. And uh, my next thought, whenever you're the consumer focus. Um, is there, is there opportunities or have you investigated and, and bear with me when I ask the question about, uh, connecting with caterers to ensure that, um, uh, the, the agri food is, uh, highlighted at different events where people from different areas attend? Uh, you, you, you read my mind. <laughs> I, I, I should have mentioned this, but most of my focus is, 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 is the, um, Oh, I'm looking for words again, is a culinary piece. Um, we have uh, a few events lined up uh, for, for uh, this coming year uh, with chefs and, and partnerships with restaurants. And that's one thing we're actively looking at is to get more restaurants involved in the network, uh, to, to, to bridge that gap, to have the culinary piece. Uh, food, food is at the heart of, of every, Food is at everyone's hearts. I, there must be an expression there somewhere. But um, food is, is, is so important and it's the way to win people over. And, and um, in my ideal scenario, we'd have a monthly event at one of our members with a chef showcasing their, their specific products, have a, have a menu offered at their, uh, at their locations. That's my dream scenario where we're still a bit far from that in terms of resources and, and funding, but, uh, but I hope to get there soon. In the meantime, there's a few events coming up this year where we will be showcasing um, our local produce in a very high-level culinary approach. Um, and thank you for that. Um, I look around the room. I don't want to take up all the space, but I have... Just one further thing to add, or to request. Um, is it possible for you to provide to our clerk information about uh, upcoming events and uh, and uh, maybe some of our council, fellow council, my fellow council members would be interesting in knowing of a schedule uh, so they could uh, <clears throat> see the fruits of the last uh, few years of uh, support and, uh, and enjoy the offerings uh, from your group? Is Absolutely, I'd love to. If there's nothing further, thank Perfect. you for the presentation. It was interesting, and, and it was a lot. Um, the information was uh, is, is valuable, and uh, I'm so glad that you're able to present it to us with uh, your plans for the future. Perfect. Thanks, everyone, for your time. Thank you.
Our next delegation is the uh, Last Resort Program uh, presented by the United Way and Cornwall SDG Human Services Department. So we have Juliette Labazier and Lisa Smith. Welcome, ladies. Good morning, Council. Thanks for having myself and Juliet to present this morning. So the Cornwall and SDNG Human Services Department frequently works with our local United Way to collaboratively resolve issues that may arise for residents um, in a variety of areas of joint mutual interest and pressure for our community. The United Way has created a program to be able to assist individuals outside of our current mandate and resource capabilities, particularly in the area of housing stability and working with residents who may be experiencing um, housing insecurity issues. I'm sure you're all well aware that our current and economic uh, issues have deepened uh, what was already a pressing housing crisis. So we know that there are a far wider range of individuals that are being impacted by this issue. And again, that is why this um, initiative offered by the United Way and the collaborative approach to working together was of interest to the city. And just to remind you, the city of Cornwall is the service manager for social services for the um, United Counties of SDNG as well as the city of Cornwall. So again, uh, Juliet will be speaking about issues that relate to the county, but again, it is connected into that social service delivery system. So first, let me premise uh, by explaining that although this program was developed by our local United Way, oh, we're not getting to the next page, there we go. <laughs> its origin comes from the vibrant communities, our safety well-being plan, a plan which this council adopted in 2022 when I came to present with the Social Development Council of Cornwall and area. The idea was first brought to light at a vibrant communities workshop in 2019, but didn't actually see the light of day until the Regional Emergency and Strategic Response Council during the pandemic decided the idea of a last resort type of funding was essential to assist individuals. The program as it stands today has evolved from that first pandemic focused program, but it continues with many of the same ideals. The pandemic taught us a very hard lesson that no one is immune to uncertainty or unforeseen events. We've all seen it firsthand over the last three years in a brother, a parent, a neighbor, or a coworker. Disaster can hit anyone, regardless of your previous financial situation and regardless of your planning. And a life altering crisis like a death of a loved one, a divorce, an illness, a job loss could propel you quickly into large amounts of debt and with mounting interest can sometimes push you right into the web of poverty, a web that is difficult to navigate back out of when you've lost so much. Where do you go for help when your friends and family don't have the liquidity that you need to pay an outstanding bill before it's too late and hard times have robbed you of the credit necessary to get a reasonable rate on a loan? If you've knocked on every door and requested help from every kind of government or organizational-led program, and none of them can keep you in your home or keep your family safe, there needs to be a last resort. While the Regional Emergency and Strategic Response Council worked on the concept of a last resort fund, a subcommittee focused working on housing and homelessness crisis, a working group that's also chaired by the United Way, was working with a group of generous philanthropists in an attempt to open our region's first emergency and transitional housing. That housing specific project did not see the light of day, but the funds that had been committed to that project were not lost, but rather combined with the principles of the last resort. 
We combined efforts and the last resort, as it officially stands today, became the last resort for all things related to safe and reliable housing in our region. And so, the last resort program strives to keep people in their homes, avoid eviction, avoid displacement, to house people who can sustain long-term housing costs, but perhaps not those initial moving costs as well as acknowledge that special needs around acquiring housing or maintaining a dwelling may arise and that there are serious gaps in our current system. The last resort helps when nothing else can. Stakeholders and a clear pathway to the funds are key to the successful rollout of programs like this. Having partners like the House of Lazarus and Agape roll out the program ensures that intake process covers all bases and excludes any duplication of service. House of Lazarus and Agape understand the needs of these individuals and have knowledge of all other funding opportunities that exist, and they can assist individuals with an application to get additional funding, such as rent subsidy, and work collaboratively with partners like our Human Services Office and the HPP program when funding can be found elsewhere. Lastly, Having clients of the Last Resort program become clients of these two entities ensures they are referred to multiple peripheral services that can assist them and their families. We are offering wraparound services to the Last, Repro Last Resort program users to avoid individuals needing to come back and utilize this service more than once. I have alluded to the fact that other programs do exist and we have carefully mapped those out to ensure that there is no duplication. In some instances, this is the only program that can help. For some, it is a complement to another program that does not suffice in a dire time of need. In year one, as we first piloted this program with the donation from our philanthropic families, House of Lazarus in Dundas County was the only community organization that was assisting us in the rollout. They graciously stepped out of their mandate and serviced all of SDG, Cornwall, and Aquasasne, and in eight months distributed $160,000 to 125 families and individuals. As you he see here, the need for help was because of a variety of reasons and we assisted in paying a variety of different types of bills. In phase two of this project, we call it year two as it became a new fiscal year for us, we welcomed on Agape. And Agape serviced clients from Cornwall and House of Lazarus continues to be implicated with us and maintain services for anyone in Stormont, Dundas, Glengarry and Aquasasne. It is therefore crucial to point out that this slide is not one that represents the total financial investment that we have made to this project this year, but rather what was invested in your regions. You can see money was spread out across the counties and to a wide range of ages, and that the highest need was directly related to rent and mortgage arrears. Why so much less of an investment in this phase? In our efforts to ensure our program is unique and we move as much as possible to a more sustainable model, in the second phase we piloted and launched in collaboration with your credit union, our region's very first ever low interest micro loans for individuals. So we at the United Way have invested funds to guarantee these loans at the lowest available market rate for individuals. When someone in need is completing the intake process with House of Lazarus or Agape, now there is an additional step of seeing if that person could pay back a low interest loan instead of simply receiving a payout. Those that could pay back a small loan do so and earn, for many, for the first time, credit. It's the opportunity to build credit and to build their way out of debt. In a sympathetic and humane relationship, with a financial institution. Same goal, dual stream of help. 
Working collaboratively with your a home working group, that's the continuation of the mayor's task for, for housing, to establish the best plans for future city-led housing initiatives that touch our entire region, working with private companies, philanthropic families, and local organizations, we are working on long-term solutions to housing stability, cost of living, and community safety. Those plans are not fast solutions and need time to roll out and actually be physically constructed. The last resort program is a bridge between now and that day that our community has sufficient affordable housing stock and the spectrum of housing types, including emergency and transitional housing, that will meet the complete housing needs of our residents. The investment in our program is an investment in housing stability that is seeing immediate results. In that first year, 25 homeless or precariously housed individuals were given a place to stay and only one family returned for a second helping hand from that program in our first three months of phase two. And that was only after living through another traumatic life event. We are helping fathers who are currently couch surfing get into apartments they can afford long term. They just couldn't afford first and last month's rent. And we gave them, for the first time in months, access back to their children because they could declare having stable housing. Not yet. We are getting people into safe and stable environments that are allowing them to get to work on time, take on more shifts at work, and afford their bills. We are ensuring people walk through the doors of peripheral services and ensure they avoid these kinds of crises in the future. We recognize this is not a sustainable, long-term solution, but we're building those. And as we get those organized and physically in, physically in place, this is proving to be the best solution for our entire region. We want your support to fight the housing crisis, one family, one emergency at a time. Thanks, Juliet. So currently, the Human Services Department administers a program called HPP. You probably heard Juliet refer to it. It's the Homelessness Prevention Program. It's provincial, fed, fed, provincial funding dollars that we receive to do work in our community around homelessness. The last resort program is complementary to what we do through HPP, because HPP can currently not meet the full need of the community, and in fact, the last resort program will reach out to different individuals who may not be able to access support through that program. Through the Social Services Relief Funding Program, which are, again, provincial funding dollars that we received during COVID, we've been able to support this program with one-time funding of 320,000. So that, again, reaches the full need that Juliet was talking about anticipated for the coming year. Again, this is a one-time initiative from the Human Services Department as the SSS SSRF dollars are not anticipated to be renewed by the province. Future funding for the program would be based on municipal tax base and as, again, reaching out to the entire region would be a collaborative funding support between city council and county council. And I can tell you that Juliet and myself did do uh, a delegation to city council last Monday. So they are also aware of what's happening with the program and um, potential need for, the fun for funding as we move forward. So, there may be future council support that's required for operating the program in 2024. Juliet will have a better sense of that um, as we come to the end of next year. And again, that would be when we'd look at potentially coming back for municipal tax base support. And that concludes our presentation. Well, thank you, Ms. Smith and Ms. Labazier uh, for the presentation. Questions, comments from members of council? Councillor Williams, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. <clears throat> thank you for that presentation. Um, it is clear that uh, while Juliet and I have spoken about this many times, uh, this is important work. It's demonstrated. Um, glad you're not asking for dollars for 2023. Uh, 
but obviously, uh, you know, there's, there's going to need to be money until the whole housing situation is finally figured out. It's going to take time. That stopgap, I can see that it's going to be required. Um, do you see any other potential opportunities for, because really it's the province that should be funding this, uh, in my view. <laughs> um, and do you see any other opportunities for, for potentially tapping into provincial dollars? So at this time, uh, in terms of what we receive for, through HPP, it is a multi-year contract. So if there were to be future increases, we would receive that at the, at the time that the program is getting close to closing out for the year and prepping for the new year. Um, at this point, you know, again, it's unknown whether there will be additional dollars. Again, we can hope that, again, the province being very well aware of what's happening with housing and homelessness, that potentially there would be future dollars, but nothing that we're aware of at this time. And through you, Mr. Warden, I'll also add on that our United Way is part of United Way networks across Ontario and across Canada that do lobby for changes that need to happen. And we are actively currently sitting on um, a committee that's working towards the new provincial budget um, and focusing on the needs for housing. So we are talking about this work that we're doing. We are gaining a lot of traction. There are a lot of regions that are interested by this program. Um, so I think moving forward, there will be support to advocate that this type of work has to happen. For example, the HPP program cannot assist someone who's a homeowner who's in arrears with their mortgage. And we are seeing right now a, a stiff increase in the number of individuals who have fallen behind in their mortgage and there is nothing out to help them. And we do not want to see people losing their homes to have to go into that rental market. Um, so it's, it's, it's making sure we're finding the holes and bringing that to the right attention at the right time. Anything further, Councillor Williams? Okay. Um, I open it up once again, members of council. Ladies, thank you very much for your presentation. It's appreciated. Um, I, I do have um, uh, maybe seen as a simple question, but the agape. Uh, what services besides uh, the food bank and the, uh, as their logo suggests, soup kitchen, do they provide, if any? Through you, Mr. Warden, um, I, I know that the Agape has plans to expand their services, and I do not want to speak on the rehab and, and make an error, but I do know that they are uh, focused on su food security with their food bank, with their um, daily soup kitchen, um, but with plans to potentially expand to, to other programs that would help uh, individuals. Um, and, and that's fine. You don't need to expand yeah. on that. Uh, and it, again, it's just the not being close to this Cornwall and being further further to the uh, west. Uh, I have yeah. some familiarity, but not a great amount of familiarity, and I just needed that clarity. I, I just, if I can, Mr. Uh, Warden. Um, House of Lazarus is well known to be a much larger and encompassing um, entity for all community needs, and uh, they're working very collaboratively with Agape so that Agape can mimic much of the services that are being rendered, and so Agape is stepping up to bring many more of those, what I spoke about, peripheral services, right? Allowing space for CMHA, allowing space for other programs to come in and meet clients where they are so that we're not always sending them door to door to door to door to find services and they fall off the track at some point and don't get what they need. It's that idea of having a one-stop shop for help um, and Agape has the, the intent to want to move in that direction and we have a great partner with House of Lazarus to lay out the groundwork of what that could look like. Well, that, that group I am quite familiar with, and uh, Ms. Ashby and her efforts uh, in supporting the community, uh, not just the local community, but the community at large, extending, um, and the services, the peripheral for services they offer, it, it's uh, quite astounding for, uh, to be brought up to speed on the services provided by them, and they are, uh, I proudly say, a good model to follow if, uh, if, if that's at all possible. So, uh, seeing uh, no other comments from members of council, I want to thank you for the presentation and uh, have a good day. Thank you.
So a shifting of chairs and Ms. Morgan, welcome. We're gonna have a housing update from Cornwall SDNG Human Services. Uh, good morning, Warden Fraser and Council, and thank you for allowing us to present here today. Uh, it's always a pleasure to come and present to County Council. Uh, many of you will remember us from the orientation that you attended in fall of 2022. Um, I'm pretty sure that was information overload for you that morning. Uh, <laughs> and so, we, you know, there was no test at the end. No, be, there'll be no test today, but uh, certainly we wanted to come back and present some more um, housing updates for you. 2022 was an extremely busy year for us, and 2023 has no signs of slowing down. Uh, so we thought it'd be really important to bring an update to Council at the very beginning um, of the year. Great, thank you. Welcome back to my second half of my other delegation. Um, this slide represents the housing continuum. I'm, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with the housing continuum, but essentially it shows the full scope of housing need from uh, emergency shelter all the way through to home ownership. So typically when it comes to special needs housing, that is where we're seeing work done around supportive housing, emergency and shelter supports, and then in the middle lies community housing, rental housing, and then moves into private market, home ownership, and um, rental housing. The reason why we're talking more about this information is to show you where the municipal focus is in terms of the service manager's work. Often the emergency shelter system is operated uh, by a not-for-profit charitable organization who may receive a combination of municipal subsidy dollars and charitable donations, but where the service manager really focuses its work is in the blue and green areas, which is around looking at community housing and affordable housing. So this is where we're trying to add um, permanent long-term housing that's affordable to the housing system with the intention of the more we can build there, then it starts to allow private market units to open up. Um, it allows us to have a place for folks who are living in emergency, emergency shelter to move into, into more stable housing. With the ultimate goal, um, at one point the ultimate goal of community housing was to move people out of community housing and into uh, private market rental housing and home ownership, and we do share that goal. So we do work with Habitat for Humanity to offer um, a down payment for families who are looking at a Habitat home, and we do about one to two of those down, down payments every year uh, through provincial funding dollars, again, that we have available, but again, as we were speaking about earlier, we know that private market housing is getting more and more unattainable for more people. So again, while we're looking at deep investments in adding permanent stock. Um, we also want to provide you with a, a bit of an update where we're going with our 10-year housing plan. Uh, the ministry mandates us um, to complete a 10-year housing plan. And we uh, completed a five-year update of that a couple of years ago. Uh, certainly, a lot has changed since then. Uh, part of that five-year update was to hire a consultant to complete a housing revitalization study for us. That study was completed uh, mid to late 2020, and certainly the landscape of housing, uh, specifically in, in eastern Ontario, has skyrocketed, where many other municipalities of cro across Ontario were able to ease into um, the, the impacts of housing, COVID exponentially uh, increased that rate in Eastern Ontario. And so what we're preparing to do in 2023 is uh, bring back that consultant to provide us with an update to that housing revitalization plan. Uh, in, 2020, uh, in 2020, it was identified that we would need 741 affordable housing units in the next 10 years to meet the demand. Uh, we suspect that that number has significantly increased, um, uh, will increase for the next uh, 10 years. So part of our uh, 2023 initiatives are to bring that consultant back to provide us um, an update on uh, that, that study. Okay, so as Melissa has mentioned, um, we are looking at updating our housing revitalization plan. I think one of the other unique features this uh, 
time potentially is our home collaborative who we're working with deeply around um, looking at how do we identify properties that may be included in this housing revitalization plan going forward. So um, that collaborative is only about probably six, three to six months old at this point, but we have active engagement from um, all of the representative, representative townships across United Counties of SD&G. So as I spoke about earlier when we talked about our investment into building community housing stock, uh, we currently have three new developments that are either going in some progress of happening or planned. So uh, Ninth and McConnell is probably the one that of course is farthest along at this point. Uh, it's probably about 50% complete. There's 77 one bedroom units that are gonna be available as a part of that build. Um, again, what you're gonna see going forward is we're looking at how to create mixed communities. So looking at mixed, mixed rental um, initiatives, also, uh, partially for the viability of the project, but also for the viability of the community. So again, there can be a lot of stigmatization around community housing and living in community housing. So the more we can do to bring in different types of renters into a community um, is just better for those that live there. We will have what we're calling um, attainable or near market rental units. So these would be like our version of private market rentals, but they will still be affordable. They will be most likely under what you would pay in a private facility, private rental um, building to be able to to be able to secure an apartment there. The other unique feature about 9th and McConnell is there's going to be 15 barrier free units. So that is also something we're looking at actively adding to our stock. Um, so barrier free units aren't fully accessible, but they meet um, all the minimum codes of the Ontario Building Code around barrier free, but in 9th and McConnell, we've actually exceeded what we need to do. Again, this is the idea that the more we can help people to age in place and have those units available, again, it's just better for community as opposed to other options that may be available until they're ready to go into maybe a more um, supported facility as folks age. Um, our Pitt Street North was just tendered on Monday, so we're very excited about that. 27 units are going to be uh, hopefully starting um, in 20, early 2023 with a goal of occupancy in late fall of 2023. These are going to be two bedroom units, so more geared to say couples or smaller families. Um, that site can actually hold 81 units of two bedroom townhouses. So what we're actually doing is looking at a phased in approach to how we add uh, building, buildings and facilities to that community property. In Morrisburg, um, I know some of the folks in this room attended the announcement in Morrisburg to talk about adding um, sites to our Glen, our Glen Morris um, initial, our facility that is in Morrisburg. So at this point, we're looking at a three-story building with 17 two-bedroom units. Again, occupancy in late spring of 2024. So you can see there's going to be a significant amount of community housing units coming online in the next uh, one to two years. The other thing uh, just to keep in mind too is um, around the cost of construction. So what construction may have cost us pre-COVID and what we're now seeing post-COVID are completely different. Uh, so again, that housing revitalization plan had identified some initial numbers of what we'd have to look at in terms of building. Again, that's something we'll have to get updated when we go out with that plan to be able to um, know the true cost to add those 700 plus units. Funding for developments is 100% tax base. We do as much as possible leverage funding dollars from other sources. Uh, we've act actively layered on provincial funding um, onto our capital builds where they have had it available and accessible for service managers to use for capital projects. We have actively worked with Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation to secure loans and grants for initiatives. Unfortunately, it will never fully fund, most likely the cost of a build. So that's where we do have to come back and look at uh, municipal tax base and taking on long-term mortgages to be able to um, sustain those projects. The one thing though to note about taking on debt for housing, it's actually considered good debt. Um, Again, being a homeowner, you know, when you're paying off your mortgage, it's an asset you're building. Same kind of thing when you take on building a community housing project. The rental revenue often will pay for the project itself over the life of the mortgage, and then it becomes an asset available to uh, the region. So 
still is debt, but considered good debt, if that makes sense as I explain the difference. So another initiative uh, in 2022 that um, we started basically developed out of the local housing plans. And so what we had determined was everybody was creating a local housing plan, but we were all working towards the same initiative. And so uh, why don't we work together to achieve that, um, those goals as a region? Uh, so uh, Glengarry, Dundas, Stormont, and the city of Cornwall, um, who had a mayor's task force, all have individual housing plans. And so what we have done is we have taken those plans and the recommendations that would impact or involve the service manager. We've combined those into um, collaborative initiatives. And with that, we developed a collaboration um, that Lisa alluded to, it's called A Home. And basically it has representation from um, every county across um, SDNG as well as the service manager and the city of Cornwall. And that collaborative has met um, for about six months now. And we have done, we've done some really progressive things. And to my knowledge, it's probably one of the few, if not the only, across the province where 100% participation uh, between service managers and the municipalities is occurring uh, to achieve the uh, recommendations of housing. Excellent. So I won't add much more to what Melissa just said about the home collaborative other than to say, really pleased with the involvement from across the region. As Melissa said, this is something unique that isn't happening in other areas. So I think it just speaks volumes about the ability of this community to come together um, and look at issues like this in an innovative approach. So I think it just bodes well for the future as we start to look at how do we address ho housing in our area. Uh, for the collaborative, uh, some of the next steps that we have and the, the one big thing we have been working on uh, is providing or, or um, creating a comprehensive list of municipally owned vacant land that possibly would include some privately owned land as well, uh, which has municipal services. And so that list is, is almost complete. Uh, and I want to um, extend my sincere thank you to Peter Young, who's been instrumental with that through the, uh, providing us with some county information. Um, initial presentations, uh, we are uh, coming to every council or asking to come to every council to provide an update on housing and those recommendations and I believe we've got everybody scheduled um, up till mid-March so that's perfect. Uh, once we do that initial presentation and then we've completed our, our comprehensive list, we will be ret returning to each uh, council to formally request uh, designation of these lands for the purpose of affordable, future affordable housing. Uh, one of the things I think that COVID has really highlighted for us is that we are behind the times in perhaps identifying municipally owned vacant lands that could be used for the purposes of future affordable housing. The biggest expense in an affordable housing project is land and if the land is donated uh, that reduces the cost that we have to then in turn uh, put over to the, the renters. Uh, one of the other things that we want to do is once that uh, list is, has been adopted in terms of identifying all the vacant lands um, that might be uh, donated, we intend to take that list and hire a consultant and we will be completing a 10-year development plan. That 10-year development plan will include all of the um, surveys that need to be completed on those lands as, as well as a draft site plan design and a cost. Um, for implementation of housing that will give us the true picture of over the ten, next 10 years if we intend to achieve that we will have the new numbers from our consultant um, at that time on the housing revitalization plan and if over the next 10 years we are to achieve that financially what that is going to look like uh, so that we're prepared um, city and county councils uh, for what that impact might be. And that concludes our presentation. <coughs> Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, I look to my fellow councillors, questions, comments, thoughts. Councillor Broad. 
Thank you, Warden, and through you, thank you very much for your presentation today. Really appreciate uh, very clear next steps in the presentation so I can take away what is required. Uh, I was part of the uh, delegation with Minister Clark that toured the new site in Cornwall. Uh, very impressed to see some of the things they're adding in, which you didn't mention, such as the heat pumps for heating and cooling and the possible addition of solar panels to the roof. It's pre-wired, and if we chose to do so, add the solar panels to create more revenue to keep us uh, revenue uh, neutral. So thank you. Well, that's good information, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, any other co questions, comments, Councillor uh, Councillor Williams? Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, as as you know, Mr. Warden and and uh, CAO Adams, um, we just attended last week, late last week, the inaugural meeting for the uh, Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus. And they are actively working on uh, a bold new program they call Seven and Seven, which is 7,000 homes in seven years. And I'm just, I'm curious, I, perhaps you have some thoughts on it yourself, um, in terms of how um, this region is going to collaborate with the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus to make sure that there is, you know, good communication, that, you know, the work that you're doing actually sort of falls in line with the work that they're doing and vice versa. Um, just Absolutely, through you, Mr. Warden. Uh, so um, CAO, Ad Mrs. Adams and the former CEO Tim Simpson and I were fortunate enough to attend the housing summit of the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus last summer. And uh, certainly one of the things that had come out of that was this type of initiative, something that uh, modeled e the EORN model, uh, but for housing. And uh, Mrs. Adams has been bringing me up to speed on where um, the Eastern Chair Wardens Caucus is with that. Uh, certainly, uh, as the service manager, uh, we are involved with providing information and working with that collaborative. If, if that uh, model is to be developed, we certainly would be part of uh, working with that collaborative however we could. Uh, and we feel our 10-year housing development plan would be uh, in line with that. Uh, certainly if it's uh, seven and seven, we could look at, uh, instead of a 10-year housing development plan, we could be looking at a seven-year housing development plan that could uh, model uh, and be part of that housing uh, seven and seven from the, the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus. Thank you, Councillor. Um, to the seven and seven, <clears throat> and uh, Ms. Morgan, as you talk about the collaborative efforts, um, uh, that was one of the bigger takeaways from that, uh, the recent Eastern Ontario Awards Caucus meeting that uh, we had, the, uh, some of us had the opportunity to attend, is the, uh, the collaborative spirit that was in the room uh, with uh, federal uh, members of parliament, our provincial members of parliament, caucus members, CAOs, and the efforts put forward, and uh, I'm sure lots of information is going back and forth, uh, and uh, and I could see that, and uh, there was um, a positive collaborative spirit understanding the needs for the 7 and 7, which it does address some of the challenges that we face in Cornwall and SDNG, and I look forward to uh, to more conversations at that level uh, as we go through this process together. So thank you for the presentation. As always, it's informative. It brings us up to speed and it makes us uh, better aware of the challenges. But I do have one question. SSRF 2, 4, and 5, what's the difference? <laughs> um, five different phases of the Social Service Relief Fund. They're just funding uh, allocations that came out at different periods of time throughout COVID. So as simple every, as that, then. As simple as that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for the presentation. Have a, have a nice day. So at this point, I look for uh, Council's indulgence as we take a 15-minute stretch your legs break. And I look to uh, our communications, Mr. Laiho, we're off air.
welcome back. Uh, we're going to uh, step into uh, action requests. Madam Clerk. The committee appointment motion is moved by Councillor Broad, seconded by Councillor Lang, and reads that, counsel, that the Council of the United Counties of Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry confirm the appointments as set out in the committee appointments report. Um, questions, comments before we ask the question. Everyone has seen the report. Everyone's uh, somewhat comfortable with the report. Uh, I know not everything, not everyone got their wish, but uh, I, I think that the process went through with integrity and consideration, and that's where we're at. Um, there was uh, an understandable concern. The committees are two-year appointments for the most part. Uh, the warden is a one-year appointment uh, for the most part, and there's potential for concern that way as the warden's designate may change, but I'm, I'm trusting that as we move forward and to the next warden sitting in this spot in a year's time that they will see fit to, uh, to, for the status quo to be maintained. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for that, but I know it's up to the warden, but that's my, uh, my, uh, my express desire for that to take place, but it doesn't always come to be. So we've all heard the question, all those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. Madam Clerk, uh, the report on transportation. It's moved by Councillor Densham, seconded by Councillor Lang, that the Council of the United Counties of Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry direct staff to take the following action identified in the SDG 43 and SDG 7 intersection safety review completed by Parsons. Install cross traffic does not stop signs on SDG 7, both north and south directions, and eliminate the northbound rumble strip on SDG 7 when the opportunity presents itself. Mr. DeHaan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden, and uh, good morning, members of council. So very uh, quickly, I'm not going to rehash the presentation we received by Parsons. Uh, staff are recommending the two, we'll call them minor, uh, minor improvements that were suggested uh, by the consultant at the time it was presented. Um, council can consider as well, and it's an option that's presented in the report to uh, engage Parsons to complete a sun glare study that cost was approximately $5,000. What would happen in that sun glare study is essentially they look at the accident history go through and, and, and use some modeling to determine the angle of the sun and then try and make a determination whether that was a cause with that then go out on site and see if, if there is a uh, correlation there or potential correlation there. The outcomes of such a study would be that essentially <laughs> we can't beat the sun and we have to look at major improvements to the intersection. So if, if council wants us to get that information, we can uh, certainly, I think, we're prepared to, well, f from our perspective, it's certainly up to council whether they want to proceed with that study or not. Thank you, Mr. DeHaan. Questions, comments from Mr. DeHaan uh, about the study? Yes, Mr. M uh, Councilor McDonald. Uh, thank you, and to you, Mr. Warden. Uh, if I recall the numbers too, there was one year with five accidents, and then that kind of skewed the average over two. So, like my my look at that is to uh, one bad year, small numbers make large variances. I'm okay uh, looking at this and doing the uh, recommended, just that cross traffic does not stop signage uh, and not going any further. So that would be where I look at it, just because that that one year with a lot of incidents and again they, they were from a stop position. I don't know that's driver behavior in the sun as you said we can't we can't beat the sun so that would be my thoughts on it thank you councillor further questions comments councillor bergeron thank you warden um the option to eliminate the the rumble strips um in my opinion i i, I can see a whole bunch of rumble strips is really annoying when you're driving because i've been over those rumble strips and once you hit one you don't want to hit the others. So you usually go to the other side of the road. But I like the idea of even just having one rumble strip, just the one rumble strip, because if someone is distracted, it wakes them up. It's like you're, if you're on the 401 or a two-lane highway and you know they have the rumbles on the edge, you just have to hit them once and that's like a wake-up call, you know, do something. And so I'm not 100% to eliminate all the rumble strips. I would like to just see one. One is enough to wake them up. And in my opinion, I've been to that corner very often. And from your description, it is a safe corner, supposed to be. 
And I think that the reason there are so many accidents today is because of distracted driving and speeding. I personally have an experience where a lot of people are on their phone now, and the stop sign is there, but if they're talking on the phone, they'll look left and right. They're looking, but they're not seeing. And I have done that once on 407. My daughter called me. I have Bluetooth. I'm in a conversation, and I missed my exit. And so, in my opinion, that's the reason there's accidents here. Thank you, Councilor Bergeron. Anything further from members of council? I, I would like to bring up, and uh, I'm somewhat uncomfortable in my role sitting as warden, uh, just um, look to my fellow councillors and, and talk about uh, the sun glare issue. If uh, for $5,000 we can put that concern either to bed or to understand that it is an issue, um, I, I just don't, uh, I, I'm not looking forward to um, down the road. Uh, having that concern raised again that we didn't address that when we had the opportunity with a consultant who's well aware of the situation uh, for the, uh, the sum of $5,000 to avoid coming to a conclusion whether that is an issue or isn't an issue and uh, I'm just uh, presenting that as, uh, as my thought on that matter looking uh, for support uh, to amend the resolution or amend the recommendation if that's uh, that's amenable to uh, to majority. Thank you, Councillor Williams. I, I would support that, Mr. Warden. Thank you, Councillor Broad. I would also support that, uh, Warden, and I'd also like to make all our future decisions based on facts of the data. Um, if there are future accidents at any intersections, if we could get to the root causes in the details, that would give us information as a uh, opposed to making assumptions on why the accidents are happening. Well, th thank you for your comments. So through you, Mr. Warden, um, I do have a draft motion to add that. It could be moved by Councillor Williams and seconded by Councillor Broad would read that the main motion be amended to add the following additional action, sun glare study. Thank you, we've heard the question. Are all those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. Thank you very much. And then through you, Mr. Warden, uh, you would then vote on the main motion as amended, and it would read, I can read it again, just so everyone's clear. Please. It was originally moved by Councillor Densham, seconded by Councillor Lang, and reads that the Council of the United Counties of Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry direct staff to take the following action identified in the SDG 43 and SDG 7 intersection safety review completed by Parsons. Install cra tr cross traffic does not stop signs on SDG 7, both north and south directions, Eliminate the northbound rumble strip on SDG 7 when the oppor opportunity presents and proceed with a sun glare study. All those in favor and opposed, seeing none, thank you very much. It's carried. Endorsement of the Forest Working Group. For you, it's moved by Councillor Bergeron, seconded by Councillor Densham, that the Council of the United Counties of Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry endorse the creation of an SDG Community Forest Working Group and the associated terms of reference for the group. Mr. DeHaan. Uh, thank you, and with me I've got uh, Phil Duncan, our County Forestry Coordinator, uh, who will be kind of leading the charge on this one. Again, we uh, talked at this uh, on this report at our last meeting, so I won't spend too much time getting into it, but happy to answer any questions that Council may have, um, or if there's any further comments that we want to get into with respect to the working group itself or the work that it's going to be doing. Thank you for the, bre <clears throat> for the brevity. Um, Questions, comments so for Mr. Hahn or Mr. Duncan? Yes, Councillor Gaino. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. Through you, there was a question um, at the last meeting about having a representative from the hunting community. I was just wondering where we ended with that. 
Yeah, uh, the, and it was a, a, a very valid question. There's certainly, um, I think from where uh, both uh, Mr. Duncan and I sat on that one, is a challenge to find essentially one, there's a lot of different group users out there and, um, and different groups out there that represent the hunting voice, and, and certainly we, we appreciate that. Um, and where we landed was we really couldn't see one uh, exact entity that would fit that role, but in so saying, our intention with the lay person that is included as a member. We have one community, SDG community representative. Our hope is that we do see some representation from, you know, as we solicit uh, members to sit on this committee, that uh, we'd be looking to have somebody that has, uh, you know, that as an interest or, or whatnot, that'd be for us maybe a preferred candidate, so that we do have that voice. Um, you know, not that I want to single out Mr. Duncan either, but he he too, he too enjoys uh, hunting and fishing and all those kind of outdoors uh, outdoor adventures. So uh, so I think he'd be a good voice too. Like he can understand and appreciate that perspective as well. Last thing to add to that as well is uh, we have the working group, but there's also going to be a lot of public engagement as well, and that's when we see that opportunity to really engage with all of those local groups that are involved in in hunting and and all and things like that. So we we feel that we've got good opportunity through this group to be able to engage those uh, those users. Anything further, Councillor? Okay, thank you. Um, anything further from members of Council? We've all heard the question. All those in favour? Opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. So we're going to move into bylaws and the uh, memorandum of understanding, Madam Clerk. It's moved by Councillor Lang, seconded by Councillor Broad, that bylaw number 5383 being a bylaw to enter a memorandum of understanding with the Friends of the Summertown Trails and the Township of South Glengarry to define permitted activities and clarify each party's respective role at the Summerstown Forest be read and passed in open council, signed and sealed. Questions, comments before I ask? Councillor McDonald. Uh, thank you and through you, Mr. Warden. Um, it would be remiss of me as this is, yeah, we're friends of Summerstown Trail. Is it modeled after other agreements just to make sure we're consistent across, or is there other agreements that we have? And then additionally, um, given, like I, I spoke to recreation and obviously the in-kind stuff is, is, is quite easy to, uh, to do. We're, we're there more often nearby on our park routes. Uh, we're looking at direct costs, we do pay for a few of the items there, and I know that the counties do as well. Uh, would there be any thought towards splitting those costs 50-50? I believe we probably paid a little bit more presently. Um, I think snow clearing and um, I guess it's called porta potties for lack of a, a, a fancy name. And if not, I, I guess I'll go back to that. Is there a standard memorandum of understanding just so we're all, like it's fair across all municipalities? That was my question. Uh, through you, Mr. Warden. So this, um, our, our memorandum of understanding with the friends um, is based really on the previous memorandum of understanding. We've kind of carried a memorandum of understanding forward, and we do have other ones as it relates to forest. Uh, the two that come to the top of my mind right away are we have a memorandum of understanding with the Ontario Woodlot Association for the Osnabrück Forest, as well as with uh, South Nation for some of the work that they support our, us with, with forestry activities. Um, regarding the, and, and I appreciate it, I think the biggest change for Council's information really with the MOU is including South Glengarry into the MOU that hadn't been done previously. So we're, we're quite happy to kind of engage with South Glengarry and include them into this MOU. Uh, and that, there are some, you know, I guess we'll call it cost concerns from South Glengarry that were raised prior to the creation of this. And I think a, a lot of those concerns had been, um, I don't know if resolved is the right way to say it, but certainly looked at and considered as part of this MOU. And, and certainly South Glengarry is in a little bit of a, has less, less in the game than it had previously. Uh, regarding, so, so this is always a, ch a challenging one, and, and Phil and I have talked about this quite a bit, is that certainly from the recreational perspective, that's local municipalities generally do that. Uh, the county is, you know, looks after forestry, so how we've tried to, and I'm going to use the term say in our lane, uh, respectively, is that we have at the county level really looked at the management of that forest and the core infrastructure in that forest, so the parking lot, the 
um, active management of the the trees and things like that. So those are the things that we are we are that we're financially responsible for. The recreational elements, that's, you know, South Glengarry has, and I think to their credit, has stepped up to the plate and supported those activities out there. Uh, so if, if council wants to entertain some kind of different cost sharing arrangement, like certainly that's, uh, like, I'm happy to, to, I work at the pleasure of council, so I'm happy to take whatever direction council wants, but that's the, the context of how this MOU was set up and kind of the historical practices in there, that's, that's why we are where we are. Thank you, Councillor, uh, and thank you, ben, uh, Mr. Dahan. Councillor Lang. Thank you, Mr. Ward, and through you, and th thank you, uh, Ben and Phil, for, for including us in this uh, Memorandum of Understanding. I think it's a good step. I mean, obviously, we've been involved before, but we weren't included in the, in the agreement. Uh, and I was at Summerstown Trails yesterday and uh, had a good talk with the, the volunteers there, and it uh, was their grand opening, I guess, or their, for their winter season. And they're telling me 22,000 people went through last year, so that's, that's pretty amazing. And I think it's a good thing that uh, this, uh, this council has, uh, has got going there. I think it's great for the community and, and the extended community. He said a lot of cars from Quebec come in. Many people from Cornwall use, use the trails. I suspect that uh, South Glengarry residents are actually a minority of, as far as the overall group, but are very involved in, uh, in the maintaining of the trails and the work in, uh, that the friends do. Um, this is going to come to our council tonight, this, this same memorandum. So we have to kind of make sure, and that's where uh, Mr. McDonald and I are coming from, is if this is going to pass our council tonight, we want to make sure we're able to uh, support it and they're going to want to know that we're behind that. So at the moment, so just to give you a little bit of an update or a little bit of a breakdown, South Glengarry pays $1,400 to remove the snow every winter. We pay $1,620 this last season for snowmobile maintenance. The two snowmobiles, I guess, are for us to look after and may need to be replaced before too long. They're 10 and 12 years old at the moment. The outhouse, we pay $3,430 to have it kept there season, for the season. So $6,450 is our cost out of pocket. And then on top of that, we give the friends a $4,000 grant every year or donation to. So we're into it for about $10,400 of out-of-pocket expenses. We also do the weekly garbage pickup. Our recreation staff just picks it up and puts it in a dumpster at our arena, so why not? We do uh, brush clearing for the trails at different points when asked, and we supply a backhoe on demand whenever they have a, a washout or something like this. And, uh, and the friends are very help, thankful to have those. And the in-kind service, I think, are great. I think we should continue to do them. Why not? It doesn't cost us a lot of money, and it's, it's helpful. But if we take out the $4,000 donation, we're at $6,400. I'm just wondering, because the only thing I could see that a financial, I mean, other than the structure of the, the building and so forth, which, I mean, the county's own, so I guess we have to pay for, is the hydro. And I'm, from what I'm understanding, the hydro is about $2,000. So if we're going to sell this, you're going to have to kind of tell me how to tell our council that this is the the fair way because <laughs> they're going to look at it we're got we're in there for ten thousand and the counties are in for about two every year and then i know there's in kind and there's the forester and, and then all the rest of it but uh just kind of uh, make me comfortable and that's fair and 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 like i said it's really up to council in terms of where they want to go with uh how much more we want to provide at the county level to the facility um uh, just for reference, the picture behind here, I took that Saturday morning. We went out for a cross-country ski. They were mid, mid, um, it, was it was gorgeous. It was absolutely gorgeous. And this was, they were halfway done grooming the trails at that point, And I counted over 35 cars in the parking lot already, at, you know, just before lunch on Saturday. So uh, just an incredible draw and incredible work that they do there to bring people in. Um, again, you know, whether, uh, you know, from the, from the annual operational side of things, yeah, we've got, I think, We've got a big investment coming up in terms of uh, addressing, we'll call it hazard trees, and that's something that we need to address, and Phil and I have been talking pretty extensively about that over the next little while. And so from the county's perspective, we do have an inv a big investment coming to manage that forest. At the same time, we're thinking of ways to actually offset those costs. For example, if we're taking the, and it's, this is ash trees that are close to the trail within a, a tree. Yeah, one falling line one falling length of, of the of the main trails because that is something you know as the emerald ash borer continues to be a problem for us killing these trees we have to get in there and be a little more proactive because we have been more reactive than proactive so um, 
our idea or our thought, and I say our, but I'm stealing Phil's thunder, uh, his thought is really if we can be proactive, get in there, take those ash trees out while they still retain some kind of value for uh, firewood or whatnot, perhaps we can offset some of those investments we need to make to be able to do that work. Um, we have, when I reflect on the parking lot, which was built and then recently expanded, uh, we, we've spent quite a, quite a chunk of change in there. And I'm going to look at Derek because he helped with this. Uh, in the order of magnitude of thirty to $40,000 for probably both of those. So we've put a lot of uh, capital money into the, uh, into the facility in the last little bit. Um, and from the hydro perspective, it just makes sense because we're paying, it's, it's our property, we were paying hydro in the summer, the friends were actually paying in the winter time, and we found, you know what, like, it just, we'll just pay the hydro, like, there's no sense in this divvying it up because it was almost as much work as it was to divvy it up than it was to pay for it uh, through, a, a, you know, outright. Um, don't know if that's a sales pitch, but just, again, the context of we're putting some big capital dollars in, um, and I... I think over the last five years when I hear those numbers and I reflect on what we've put in over the last five years, it's probably not far off. And I'm looking ahead to what we have to put in there in terms of time and effort. Hopefully we can recoup our costs, but certainly you know, from, the, from a risk management perspective, we've got to put, a, put an investment in there in the near future. Thank you and through you. Um, much appreciated for that. Although I do think capital, because we own the property, it's the counties that it is kind of our responsibility because, I mean, whatever happens, it, it's our property. Um, I'll throw it out there, and I don't know if there's support or not, and uh, uh, just to see what my colleagues think, but uh, what if we split? We don't mind keeping doing our in-kind. I think we should. I think it's only right, and we'll keep our donation, but the, the $6,400 and even the hydro, if, if those were all added up, the, the cost, and we split them, would that be agreeable to people? It would be a little better for the township that way. Um, yeah, I, I will open it up to uh, receive comments from other members of council, but I, I reflect back, Mr. Ahan, on the, uh, the traffic circle uh, agreements with uh, the, the structure, if you would, and the safety aspects of traffic circles. I'm using the right term, aren't I? Roundabouts, Roundabouts thank you. It didn't seem right in my head. Uh, yeah, is, uh, the, the, the cost of the roundabout borne by the counties and whatever other funding is achieved, uh, received, uh, but then it becomes the soft aesthetics, I believe it is, and uh, shared 50%. Uh, and uh, that seemed amenable to, to us at the time, but I uh, just want to throw that out there as a thought. So, questions com or comments to uh, South Glengarry's concern. Mr. Councillor Dencham. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And I, I think um, mine is more of a question, and it's maybe uh, to foster some input from people who have been on County Council for, for some uh, time. Um, I see this as a fantastic drawing card for economic development into the community and would bring a lot of people into the community. Um, and I'm not sure what the relationship, given the fact that we haven't had an economic developer in North Starmont for a while, I'm not sure what the general relationship is or the understanding is in terms of cost splitting um, and how uh, economic development may come into play on this because, uh, again, I, I think it's, it's a fantastic uh, drawing card. It's, it's a great facility for public use and even though uh, it may not be used by a lot of the locals, you're bringing a lot of traffic in, and, and again, which really stimulates your local economy and, and has the potential to bring people back in the summertime as well. So uh, really, it's just another dimension that I guess I'm looking for input is, uh, you know, when, when we see that, uh, these local amenities uh, that exist within a municipality, is it generally the practice that the, um, that the, the second tier uh, looks after some of these costs as part of their economic development plan, or is this something as well that uh, at the county level we, we look to, to foster and support as well? Uh, thank you for your comment and question. And again, I open to the floor. Councillor Williams. Um, thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not sure I can answer your question, but... Uh, to my knowledge, there hasn't been an economic development component in terms of this type of discussion, to my knowledge. Um, would, you, would you say? 
Um, my, my question is with regards to, because you're asking for cost sharing for s snowmobiles, the snowmobiles and, I'm sorry, I missed. There's the, the cleaning of the parking lot, the snowmobile maintenance, and the uh, vehicles. The right. Um, so I guess my question is with regards to the snowmobiles, are they, you know, is this recreation related? Uh, because as far as I'm concerned, the counties, we, the county owns forests and maintains them. Then they're used for recreation purposes. But, but to, to my understanding, the county's is not, um, does not manage recreation uh, on behalf of anybody. Um, is, is that correct? So I, I guess the, the question is, is, does this fall within the mandate of, of the counties? Uh, I, I, you know, snow clearing, I know the counties, was, half of what you do is snow clearing. Yeah. Um, I mean, can that be considered an in-kind, um, uh, do you have, you have to pay somebody to do it? I guess you can't do that in-kind. Um, but anyway, my, I guess my primary question is with regards to the snowmobiles. Are they used for recreation? In which case, it seems to me that that would be a township responsibility. I'm gonna to try to- uh, And I'll let uh, Councillor Lang respond to that. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I'm through you. I'm going to try to respond to the best I understand it, and then maybe Ben and if he'll have, have more. But the, this money is is to help. All of these items are to help the Friends of the Summerstown Trails, the volunteer group that organizes the trails, grooms the trails, and and does most of the work there. And 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 I don't think this would be at all successful if they were not involved. It's my own personal opinion. So the snowmobiles are there strictly for grooming. They have three or four different grooming attachments that go on the back so that they can pack fluffy snow and then they put the, the, the tracks for the cross-country skiers to use. And uh, so that's what the, the snowmobiles are, are there for as far as I, and maybe they, I don't know if they use them to go out and uh, to get to locations in the winter to maybe trim brush or something like after that ice and so forth. But it, it's not recreational other than to support the recreational activities of the people that come in and use the trails. Councillor McDonald. Thank you, and to follow up on uh, Councillor Lang and uh, Councillor Williams' comment, I think what you're trying to say is the snowmobiles support our recreation, so, and that's not really a county thing. However, then, if the hydro is already absorbed, perhaps just adding the, the, the part clearing, because that is part of the asset that the county owns, and that's, it's not exactly 50-50, but it's a little closer, so I, I think that might be a fair compromise where like, the snowmobile and washrooms do support our recreation programs, but the snow clearing is part of the asset that you uh, that you maintain, and I don't know if that's a, a fair thing to, to to answer your question about recreation being not a county responsibility. Councillor Williams. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I can support that. Councillor McGillis. <clears throat> well, thank you, Mr. Warden. So, uh, Councillor uh, McDonald, you're you're saying for, forget about the snowmobiles at the cost of six thousand some dollars with the with the washrooms. So you're just saying snow removal now? Is that what you're asking for support? I, I'm listening to Councillor Williams' comment about recreation. Perhaps that would be more amenable to council. So yeah, if, if, the, if the whole is not 50-50, then, then that can work too. I mean, we, I think we will still at South Langary administer all of it. It's just that cost sharing component we could send to the county. Councillor McGillis. Subsequent question. Uh, so what would that add up to? Yes. Uh, and thank you and through you, Mr. Warden. Um, so the park clearing was 1,400 approximately, and I believe the uh, hydro is about 2,200. So, so that is a little under half, but it, at least it kind of lines up with what you're saying is the strategic direction of uh, SDNG County might not uh, support the recreation of South Glengarry. Okay, I will support thank that. Thank you, uh, so there's I will support those that. questions about recreation been answered. Um, I would suggest, uh, unless the bylaw could be revisited or, or revised on the fly, do uh, I, I look at our clerk, do we want to defer this to the next meeting? Is it uh, possible to defer this until it's uh, refined? Through you, uh, Mr. Warden, Ben, um, if you wanted, we could add it to section three if you thought that was appropriate under the county's responsibilities. We could be specific and add a point eight there to uh, snow removal if Ben thinks that wording's appropriate. 
Yeah, no, that, that's, I think it's pretty clear if Council's supportive of that. I'm happy to just to continue to move this along if that's that procedurally is okay. Uh, just if I may, Mr. Warden, um, appreciate the offer to continue to administer that uh, contract, like the actual clearing contract, and we pay for it because uh, we don't actually have any uh, snow clearing contracts. I know the municipality with all your recreational and other facilities you own that it's the, I, my, my understanding is it's part of a more large tender. So, uh, you know, for us, that's a much easier way to administer that, and I'd be happy to, uh, if, you know, that makes sense to me, the direction Council's taking here. Yes, Madam Clerk. So through you, Mr. Warden, um, we could have an amending motion that reads that Council uh, amend the bylaw by adding a point eight in Section 3 to the County's responsibilities, reading snow removal costs. Is that appropriate, Ben? Okay. Can I have a mover and a seconder, then? Um, Councillor Williams, Councillor Lang. All those in favor and opposed, seeing none. Okay, we'll move on to the next part. Um, thank you, and I'll just read the motion one more time to approve the bylaw as amended. It was originally moved by Councillor Lang, seconded by Councillor Broad, and reads that bylaw number 5383, being a bylaw to enter a memorandum of understanding with the Friends of the Summerstown Trails and the Township of South Glengarry, as amended, to define permitted activities and clarify each party's respective role at the Summerstown Forest, be read and passed in open council, signed and sealed. All those in favor? And opposed? Seeing none, carried. Thank you very much for your time and effort on this, to all. Oh, and I'd be remiss not to thank uh, Mr. Duncan for his efforts to support Mr. DeHaan. I know it was there. <laughs> A consent agenda, Madam Clerk. It's moved by Councillor Densham, seconded by Councillor Bergeron, that all items listed under the consent agenda section of the agenda be received for information purposes. Before I call the question, is there anything to add from department heads or managers? Seeing none, all those in favor? I'm going to oppose. Seeing none, that's carried. Boards and committees. Uh, there wouldn't be much to report, I'm sure, but uh, as was mentioned earlier today, uh, there was an Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus meeting. Uh, I had the good fortune to attend with our CAO, Ms. Adams, and the past warden, Councillor Williams. And I just want to give a quick overview on some of the immediate priorities that came up in discussion with our MPs and MPPs. As was mentioned, uh, as we had uh, the presentation from Ms. Morgan today, uh, the 7 and 7 housing project, um, it was, there's 7,000 homes identified in uh, the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus per uh, area that they're looking to have 7,000 homes built in seven years to support the housing needs that are out there that we all understand. And uh, I believe the number, uh, Councillor Williams, in our area 688, was or that was the number identified in this seven and seven project. There's a rural housing information system. Uh, there was, uh, that's one of the priorities and I believe uh, Mr. Mr. Young has participated in supporting that effort in identifying uh, opportunities and struggles and uh, in our area. So it's available to those that are seeking to uh, find employment, uh, to find employees, to find opportunities in our area as well as other areas within Eastern Ontario. Um, there's an update um, from the Eastern Ontario Regional Network about the efforts to increase broadband and cell service and is ongoing. Uh, Roger's a big player in it now and uh, there's lots of investment taking place in Eastern Ontario and uh, although I'm sure we all still suffer a lack of service in certain areas but uh, I, I've been led to understand that we need to have faith it is coming and it is moving on quite, quite rapidly at this point. And uh, an update from the Eastern Ontario Leadership Council about some of their efforts and um, 
that's an arm of the Eastern Ontario Regional Network, an arm of the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus, and bear with me when I don't have all the answers to all these things. Uh, that was my first uh, first meeting, but I, I will get up to speed and be able to bring forward more information as, uh, as I learn more. I don't think there's anything else that can be brought up from uh, boards and committees as we uh, have just established all the members, so I'll leave it at that. We'll move into uh, key information. Oh, I'm sorry, before I do move into key information, uh, Ms. Franklin, Carmen uh, Councillor Williams, is there anything that you could add that you feel you should add to what I just said? Thank you. And uh, Madam CAO, is there anything you'd like to add to the Warren's Caucus meetings? I think through you, Mr. Warden, what I will do is there's a couple of presentations that will be taking place at Roma. So I'll find where those are located on the agenda and I'll send an email to council in case you want to hear the, some of the information. I know that the rural housing information tool, they're going to be doing a uh, presentation I heard on center stage. So there might be some information that I could flip to council members in case you're available to attend and you might just find it interesting. Thank you for that. So now I will move into key information. Ms. Franklin, uh, the service delivery review. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Warden Fraser, uh, me members of council, and just a little wee uh, welcome to library board for members, uh, members of council. Looking forward to working with you in the months ahead. So uh, I have to give you just a little bit of background, uh, uh, for, especially for those of you who might be sitting new to the table. In 2022, the library uh, undertook a new strategic plan process, which was uh, finally received and, and approved in June of 2022. And one of the first pieces of business with the st new strategic plan was to undertake an organizational review. So in September of 2022, uh, we sent out an RFP and we, uh, the board selected TCI Management Consultants out of Toronto, uh, who, would in, who scooped up uh, other consultants in, on, in, to do this uh, management, or sorry, this uh, organizational review, uh, Beth Ross and Associates. Beth Ross used to be the county librarian for Bruce County, and Bibliotex, which is a technology-based con consultancy dealing specifically with technologies uh, for libraries. So they began their work in early, tw uh, early September of 2022, and submitted their final report to the library on December 9th. So like a lot of, a lot of activity was kind of squished into the second half of, well, all, all of 2022, but certainly that second half of, of the year. Um, we had a special meeting on December 19th to formally receive the final report and to discuss some of the uh, recommendations that uh, were presented. So uh, I have given you a link to that report. You, I, I'm always encouraging people to come to the library's website and check us out through the website. We've got a lot going on at the library, so anytime I can get people to drive to the, li the library and its website, I do so. Um, so the service delivery review made a total of 20 recommendations in seven areas of uh, consideration. And at our December 19th meeting, the board uh, focused on those recommendations, the first four recommendations in the service delivery review report that, that focused on organizational structure, professional capacity, and our human resources. Some of you probably know we have, like most businesses, organizations, institutions, uh, been short-staffed for quite some time, so this provided an opportunity to for uh, 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 investigation of what our staffing and capacity needs are. So, um, so the uh, board gave direction during that December 19th meeting to look at specific positions that were identified in those first four recommendations. Um, systems librarian, community uh, systems librarian position, um, uh, system, oh, sorry, system support coordinator position, marketing and communications coordinator position, and then the eventual succession of senior management. So the board, uh, we did that, and the, the board uh, formally received the entire report and made it public as per 
proper procedure. The other 16 recommendations in the six other categories, those categories being public programs and services, policies and procedures, networking and communications, branches and facilities, technology, and finally governance, those will be looked at over time by the board and considered, it is a report, it is, not, it is not a cast in stone or marble or whatever, it is a report so it gives the, the, the board um, and a new board coming in ample opportunity to um, get familiar with the library, the library systems, our, our resources, our programs, our, our many, many activities and draft, you know, kind of map a, a, a path going forward. Um, and I think that's about it. And it's a go the, the report they gave, the, the consultants gave it a five-year timeline. So as I say, there's, like, there's lots of time to kind of get to familiar with things and, and for the new board to cr determine its priorities and direction. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, thank you for the presentation, uh, for your uh, report. Uh, Councillor Bergeron. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, a very simple question. I, I read the, re the what you we had in our package, and I have no clue what a graphic novel is. I just would like you to explain. Sure, that. no problem at all. Graphic novel is a story told largely through pictures. Pictures. Okay. Pick more more illustration than um, words, and which is you know we we're used to that when we're young children, but uh, as as we get older, and um, it may be something that is not encouraged, shall we say, but the, the ability for a picture, as we know, picture says a thousand words, the ability for a good picture to be able to uh, enhance a, a, a tale, a story being told or an idea being expressed is uh, quite powerful. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes, Councillor McDonald. Uh, thank you and through you, uh, Warden Fraser. Um, I would encourage everybody to please look at uh, that strategic plan. Uh, we always ask for finding efficiencies. Uh, the library has done probably, uh, well, I'd say a very good job, but with trying to find efficiencies, you look at some of the recommendations and they are considering the closing of several or at least a few branches. I'd like to remind everybody that uh, although many of us in this room are able to afford internet and therefore we think that libraries may not be as important as they once were, this is perhaps the greatest mechanism to bring bring people who um, uh, don't have the means that all of us have in this room right free books free internet we take internet for granted for many of us there are those who need it and um, i will strongly support keeping as many libraries as possible just give that page a view the links there it's page 59 of 74 uh, and it kind of spells it out for you so it's good to find efficiencies but do keep in mind that uh, we, we have we have um, people who don't have the same means as us. I just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention. I'm a big library fan, I have my card in my bag. <laughs> <laughs> and if I may also uh, just reiterate, the report is a report. It is not cast in stone. Thank you. Well, I want to thank Councillor McDonald for his fervent support of, of the benefits of having a library system in sd &G. I believe that's where you're getting, where you're going with that. But uh, uh, thank you for the report, the presentation. Uh, anything else from members of council and Madam CAO? Through you, Mr. Warden, if I may, I'd like to uh, just let everybody know since I've come on board in the counties, many of the managers have been fantastic to get me up to speed. Uh, Karen, certainly one of those. And uh, Karen has had, I think, 14 very successful years with the counties, but I thought I would share with everybody this morning that Karen has provided us with her notice and her intentions to retire, which will be uh, at the end of June. So I'd like to thank her for uh, providing lots of notice and allowing us to transition and find a new path. But it has been excellent working with Karen over these last two weeks, and we will continue to work together very well. But I wanted to just let everybody know that uh, and congratulate Karen on uh, her decision to to retire and we've got lots of stuff to do between now and then but she's fully committed to we have transition. lots of stuff to do between now <laughs> and june 30th but some won't get done and then it's someone else's problem <laughs> thank you
And, and um, I echo some of the words uh, spoken by our uh, Madam CAO. Um, Karen, uh, and you know I, I'm, a, I'm a, a big supporter of you, of, of who you are, of your commitment to us, commitment to the, the library in SDG, commitment to the library board, commitment, commitment to your beliefs. Uh, we, we all, those of us who have been fortunate enough to get to know you, understand that and appreciate that and your service to uh, all of us, to all of our community, to anyone that wants to read, is hoping to read, hoping to do things like that, go to the library, seek different uh, uses of the library, of our facilities. Um, much of that falls at you and it's well appreciated for your efforts and I do thank you for all of your efforts. But the new council members that are joining the library board, uh, too bad. I've been fortunate to sit with Karen for four years and I'll have a bit more and uh, the new members of the board won't have such luck to spend as much time as I have, but uh, it, it's, you will see uh, at our future meetings uh, the passion that uh, Ms. Franklin has for all things library and I'm sure you'll appreciate it too, as I have. Thank you very much. Mr. DeHaan and Mr. Jans, the cheap stuff. Yeah. Uh, so next uh, three reports that we're uh, discussing with council are really related, but uh, you know, we did want to spend, uh, Mike and I wanted to spend a little bit of time with council to talk uh, very specifically about the South Nation River Bridge project that we have uh, tentatively proposed in our budget for next year and uh, as well as County Road 22. And I do want to note that I'm still not used to saying 2023, so if I say 2022 budget, I'm talking about the 2023 budget. So my uh, advance apologies. Um, South Nation River Bridge is the one we'll start with, and just to give Council a sense uh, for those that maybe are not familiar with where it's located, it's actually one of our biggest structures in SDNG, believe it or not. Uh, it's a uh, multi-span structure that crosses the South Nation River right outside of Chesterville. So where County Road 43 bypasses Chesterville, you have to cross uh, this bridge. Um, it's not in great shape right now. It's uh, at an advanced level of deterioration. Uh, the uh, pictures here kind of illustrate what we're looking at. Of course, the you know, salt coming in, the d typical deterioration you see on structures of this type, and it is due for rehabilitation. So we are at a point where we are, we are ready to redo this bridge. So the challenge we face with this structure is that the design and construction of the bridge doesn't facilitate a stage detour very, very well for several reasons. One is it's a long structure, so um, it gets very disruptive and, and whenever you stage construction, which is the typical way that we like to do uh, construction work uh, for our bridges, it means you close down a lane, you work on one lane, reopen that lane now that it's nice and pretty, close down the other side, do the other side. Uh, with a very large structure, it gets very challenging to do that in one construction season. So uh, in this bridge in particular, it's a two construction season type of construction activity. So it's going to be very disruptive for a very long period of time. Uh, the second issue is as well, as, as you can kind of see here, this is uh, what it looks like in terms of the cross section of the structure and you know, envision the temporary uh, concrete barrier that's there separating the bridge. What um, sometimes we're very fortunate to have is the way the girders, which are the, you know, those beams that are underneath it, the way they're arranged allows pretty efficient, you, it, it, there's no safety concerns, but in this circumstance, if you can imagine a uh, you know, imagine you have one lane open, you're removing the deck or, mo or most or part of the deck on the other side to rebuild it back up. What you end up having here in, in this circumstance, which is uh, certainly not desirable, is you have a cantilevered edge that comes out from underneath that girder. So it does get very challenging on, in terms of how you actually stage this bridge so that you don't create some kind of long-term problem or failure or issue with that piece that's sticking out beyond that girder number, you know, one, two, between two and three. So it is a little bit challenging. It can be done, but the way you do it is actually a slow and deliberate type of rehabilitation where you're building the deck, you're letting it cure, maybe you're working in one area and then far away and then you're coming back in between and doing kind of hopscotching around a little bit just to make sure that you're developing the right kind of strength in the opposite side so that that bridge maintains its overall strength and can support the traffic that's going through it. So 
you know, it's very easy to say, well, big bridge, let's get a lot of people in there and get the work done. We can't in this circumstance because we really have to deliberately stage the work through the, through the construction season to be able to accommodate this issue that we have right there. So uh, what we're talking with council about today is the consideration for a closure of County Road 43 and a detour of 43 through Chesterville uh, on county roads for the duration of the 2023 construction se season in the asterisk subject to budget approval, of course, for this, this bridge. Uh, what that looks like actually um, uh, in terms of structures, and I'm not you know, again, this is ultimately, you know, we're looking for council's direction on this one. It's a, a key information report, looking for that feedback and direction. It's not, it's not an action request. Um, but what's different with this structure compared to a lot of the other structures we've looked at and talked about, um, we're able to use county roads, the entire detour. The actual detour itself is relatively short. So from a extra kind of commute uh, length, it's adding, I think, a kilometer at most, Mike. Do I have that correct? Anyway, it's adding very, it's adding very, very minimal detour kind of length to it. Uh, we can actually stage it to make use of both County Road 9 and County Road 37, depending on how we stage it. We really haven't put a lot of time and effort into thinking about this. We wanted to talk to council first. So um, really what we're here today uh, to do, and we're gonna talk about the four recommendations, but from the advantage side of this closure, we're talking about a cost savings of over, or estimated at $400,000 if we're able to shut the bridge down, give the contractor the entire bridge where they can do it in the entire season and detour that traffic. Um, again, reduces the time of disruption because if we do not close that structure, um, we will have to do this in 2023 as well as 2024. Um, we are using county roads and we get it done quickly. Disadvantage, of course, and, and it goes without saying, is that this is gonna be disruptive to the, uh, to the citizens who live in Chesterville. There's, there's no doubt about that. And I, I think we need to, we need to recognize that and, and make sure we include that consideration in this discussion. Uh, again, the disruption is additional commute time. Yes, it's only you know, at most a kilometer more, but it's a kilometer more at a slower speed with stop signs and all sorts of traffic control through Chesterville. So there is, it's a kilometer more, but it is adding minutes onto someone's uh, detour through, uh, through Chesterville. So what we're uh, recommending to council uh, today, or you know, our, our recommendation through this key information report, looking for council's feedback, support, or otherwise uh, uh, suggestion that no, they're, they're not comfortable with this. Uh, we're recommending that council support the closure of County Road 43 to facilitate the rehabilitation of the bridge during the 2023 construction season. Um, that we at staff, the staff level, prepare a preliminary detour plan, communications, and public relations strategy uh, to help mitigate those challenges with the detour of County Road 43. Uh, through Chesterville, we request the delegation with the Township of North Dundas and uh, meet with their council to advise of council's direction in this matter, get their feedback and input prior to finalizing that detour plan, uh, and to make sure that they are, um, you know, we get as much information and support from <coughs> North Dundas as we possibly can, and then come back to this council to, uh, after completing the above. And we're at a point, just for council's information, we're at a point right now in the design where um, you know, you can, you can get to a, progress to a certain point in design where it doesn't matter whether it's staged or not staged, but we're at that point now in the design where the, co the consultant would like to know, are we staging this because I really have to finish my design based on that staged uh, construction? Or no, like it's going to be completely open to the contractor because it does impact how they, how they do that design work. And again, this all feeds up into the discussion we're going to have about budget and uh, the key information report we're presenting not next, but the one after, uh, because it is, you know, if this was $40,000, if I'm being honest with you, I could appreciate, you know, there may be some, you know, the, the consideration may be different, but we're talking about a substantial amount of money in, in sa cost savings for the county uh, by closing that roadway. So is there anything I missed on that, Mike? Okay, we've got it all for now, and uh, happy to uh, get feedback from uh, County Council in terms of what direction we should be taking. Thank you for that report, Mr. DeHaan. So I will open up, will open it up to uh, comments, questions from uh, members of County Council. Yes, uh, Councillor Densham. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and uh, thank you, Ben, for your report. 
Um, although uh, I live in North Stormont, I travel that, uh, that road, 43 specifically, a lot back and forth because my grandkids are just in the area that you're going to be working in. So, uh, uh, but I've also noticed there's a lot of oversized traffic as well that comes on 43 now, whether it be modular housing or other huge equipment. And I wonder how that plays into the, uh, the rerouting of, of traffic, both in terms of will it take some of the corners, because some of these things are pretty big that I see going down 43, or is there a contingency for, for travel, and also the additional wear and tear that might then take place on the, the, the um, rerouted roads? Uh, the, in terms of the overdimensional loads that you see on County Road 43, uh, we approve them, so they come into us. Anything that exceeds the Highway Traffic Act needs a permit from SDNG, so we are issuing, I want to say, close to 1,000 different types of moving permits on an annual, any given basis, any given year. Um, so essentially what that means is that we are going to direct them elsewhere. We're not going to make them use that detour, you know, unless it makes sense for them to use the detour. But in my mind, I've, I've thought of this already, they're going to be taking a different route, either north or south of 43, to be able to get around this construction uh, or this issue uh, for this season. So. In my mind, we're trying, going to try and keep them out of Chesterville to the greatest extent possible. And whether it's using County Road 9 or something like that uh, further north, that's likely what the outcome is. In terms of the wear and tear, it is going to, it is, it will be a problem. It will be, we're going to see a little bit more accelerated wear and tear on those roadways. But they are built to a county standard. Um, 37 is relatively new. County Road 7, we've done parts of it over the years. So it's, they're, they're both in relatively good shape. So I'm, I'm, confident that particularly if we're taking overweight stuff or the overdimensional that you know it's transport trucks that are really the the killer on a roadway um, if we can try and reroute as much of that as possible you know I think we're going to do a good job at maintaining a relatively good shape of roadway through Chesterville thank you for that uh, further questions comments concerns about uh, this major under this would be a major undertaking that is uh, I'm, I'm quite confident to say that so uh, to, to piggyback to on to Councillor Densham's comments about wear and tear, and that is uh, <clears throat> that is one of my concerns, uh, Mr. Dahan, is, uh, and, and I, I'm sure you're well aware of the issue at uh, 9 at the, uh, where it intersects 43 at the railroad tracks, the dip in the road and things we've talked about in the past. And, and, I, and, I, and I don't need to rehash that conversation, but I, I do need to speak, to, uh, I do need to express that. And that would be one of my concerns. I'm, I'm looking, uh, I, I guess I, I, being from North Dundas and growing up in Chesterville and thinking how there was never an overpass there in my time, at one time in my life, uh, that overpass uh, wasn't there. Um, and uh, the trucks managed the intersections in that community at the time. And uh, I can't see this taking two seasons. Uh, the, the upset whenever I think of the uh, the uh, the bridge work done on 31 just north of Winchester and the the upset that has caused with the ex the extended season of that repair <clears throat> and I'm sure with uh, good communications good signage uh, advance notice this is uh, this one season project would be beneficial to the community as opposed to two because I, I imagine there will be I, I, I don't want to think about a two season or a, or a stage construction and uh, the consternation that that caused that I experienced in, in North Dundas with 31. But anyway, I, uh, I should continue with the floor. Councillor Broad, then Councillor Bergeron, and then Councillor uh, oh, <laughs> Councillor Manley. Thank you, thank you, Warden. Through you to Mr. Dehan. Uh, the detour time may actually be less because I've sat at that light on Highway 31 through two or three cycles as there is large volume. Um, one other thing, the, with the deterioration of the roads, we wouldn't know without actually physically counting cars, but less traffic may travel that if they know that bridge is out, they may choose alternate routes altogether. So we would not know that. Uh, the safety aspect of trying to do it as a stage event uh, is concerning. So I would, I would definitely look to let's have the savings and, and do the detour. Thank you for your thoughts. Councillor Bergeron. Thank you. Um, I'm on the same page. Uh, staging would take too long. Uh, the other, uh, which was mentioned before, the oversized vehicles, they wouldn't even fit on the staging anyways. They would have to go around. So either way, they have to be rerouted. Um, being from North Dundas, 
we probably won't be really popular if we recommend a detour through Chesterville because it will create more traffic. But as far as I'm concerned, the sh if we can do the time span much short, one season is better than drawing it out for two years. And as you said, waiting there at a red light for many, yes, it's just as bad. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughts. Councillor Manley. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, ben, just a, a timeline then. You say one season, what does, what does that entail? Um, we've had, we've been real challenged with our bridge work, uh, the, over the past, well, you know, since the pandemic, quite frankly, uh, that, that industry is no different than every other industry out there where it's hard to find the people to do the work. Uh, so for me, one construction season is as soon as we can give the job to them, which would be, you know, we'd be tender ready. I, I don't want to put, you want to take that? Go ahead, Mike. <coughs> Right now, the consultant is estimating that a full closure of the project would take 20 weeks, and with stage construction, it would take 25. So, so at least one month and one week more. Uh, and then, of course, uh, once we actually get a, the, the, the crews on the bridge and, and not everything happens in an ideal fashion, you find something that you didn't expect under the concrete. Uh, one batch of material takes longer than expected. Those are ideal times, and uh, out in the field, it, it always takes just a, a little bit more. So when, when we're looking at a 25-week project, there's a, there's a big uh, uh, schedule risk there that uh, it's, it's going to balloon into something that you just can't fit within one season, uh, especially when our, our in-window uh, work starts um, beginning of July and frost starts coming at you know November uh, the snow starts falling the asphalt plants start closing one of the last things we do on a bridge is we, we pave the approaches we pave the deck it's, it's one of the last things we have to do and if we're stretching into December and that's not an option then we have a problem through the winter on that structure so uh, if we were looking at uh, a stage construction uh, we would have to probably be practical and, and say that we'd be better off doing stage one one year getting it paved before the plants close, come back the next year, do it, and, and then we know we can get it done. Uh, so, so right now under ideal conditions, 20 and 25 weeks for the two alternatives. And, and that's Mike's way. So essentially if we can close it, we start as soon as we can. We have to be conscious of working uh, with the like near water. So that's like a critical date for us, but we're done usually November is it if we're done early November we're doing well these days that's that's the way it seems to be going anything further I, I look forward to the public I guess it would be somewhat of a public meeting I, I look for, forward to that uh, be it a, a PIC uh, in Chesterville, I'm, I'm thinking, I know there's going to be a presentation, and I understand there'll be a presentation with the, uh, the Township of North Dundas Council and staff uh, to, that, to us, but uh, uh, yes, uh, a PIC may be something that we need to have. Uh, that's, a, that's a great idea, and I think that's well worth, uh, well worth investing some time and effort into. It's a good point. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Okay, uh, the next uh, topic to discuss is uh, County Road 22, just a, a project update. And I know we, uh, we certainly have, um, over the next little bit, we're going to be kind of getting out there with the community and, and trying to get more information out in front of, uh, of people. And similarly, when I think of County Road 34, same idea. Um, County Road 22, there's kind of two questions that we want to bring to Council right now. The first question is maybe the easier of the two questions. Um, as we are looking at um, cross sections of that roadway and whatnot, uh, our, the county's current policy looks to have a 26 meter right of way. So that's uh, 13 meters, so the center line is the middle of the right of way, 13 meters on each side is typical of the county. When we look at road widenings and things like that, we can generally fit most of our infrastructure in a 26 meter right of way. It does get challenging, I'm not gonna lie. It does get challenging, particularly when we have utilities like water, sewer, um, gas, uh, broadband, things like that. It, it starts to get very congested in the right of way. As our consultant, I guess the, one, of the, one of the 
unique things of County Road 22, for example, is that there is also municipal drains that are adjacent to the roadway. Uh, it's starting to get very difficult for us to fit everything into the 26 meter right of way. Our consultant has recommended that the county look to uh, secure a 30 meter right of way as part of the road widenings on that project. And so question number one to council is, uh, does council also support the 30 meter right of way? At a staff level, we do believe that that's the right uh, decision, but uh, we would be looking to council to make sure that they're supportive of that approach on the cross section. So, comments about uh, Mr. DeHaan's concern about a 30 meter right away and the acceptance of. Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, <clears throat> I, I went to that uh, open house and um, for the most part, the people that were there, the ones who live, uh, you know, right along there. And uh, I mean, you would know more than I might because you were talking to them, but uh, I did get the sense that there was concern about this roadway coming right up to their front door. Um, and so taking 30 instead of 26, will you be in their entranceway? <laughs> I, I mean, I, you know, how much difficulty is this going to actually provide to these homeowners? I guess that's, that's my question. Hey, go ahead. Right. So the exhibits that were shown at the consultation did show a 30 meter right away. And so they were, they were looking and uh, they, some of them had, uh, I believe, taken measurements or had approximate numbers in their head of uh, if, if that width was taken, how f where would the property line be relative to the front of their house? And some of the, the numbers were as small as 20 feet, uh, which, which they didn't, uh, certainly didn't like uh, being on a, on a county road with the speed of traffic that moves on county roads and uh, some of them having pets and children and, and uh, whatnot that they, they would have to um, uh, worry about with the road creeping closer and closer to the front of their house. Uh, I believe um, snow banks were a concern, drainage and grading. As some of these houses are potentially 100 years old and uh, they're, they're not, they weren't built as, as high up as we necessarily do now. Um, and so there, there were several houses uh, f further to the west in the area of, of the Fraser Road intersection where um, there, there are residents that would be adversely affected by that. Uh, most of the, the more recent houses uh, were built uh, pro probably at least 30 meters from the road and uh, th their concerns were loss of yard uh, more than, than anything else and, and it's not a drainage or a, a sp speed of traffic or you know even perhaps you know a vehicle leaving the road concern for them um, that I believe there were two attendees that that s spoke to that uh, both having houses close close to the road uh, the r remainder of the attendees were primarily farmers and for them it was just loss of, of tillable land Anything further, Councillor? If, if I may, Mr. Warden. So uh, is there anything that the county do, can do to, to mitigate that in terms of, well, especially things like, you know, if water now will be running, running down towards their property, for example, like how will you mitigate that? Um, so whether it's 26 meter right of way, or just I guess keep this in mind, or a 30 meter right of way, the vehicles are no closer because the, they're centered and then it's coming off of the center. We're not paving wider because it's wider. The, 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 the pavement we're providing is the pavement that we're providing whether it's 26 or 30 meters. The beauty of, or the advantage of the 30 meter right of way is it actually allows us to maintain the ditches a little bit better. I think of uh, County Road 19 north of Williamstown in particular, like there's a road where we probably should have looked at a, 20, a 30 meter right of way because we have some very steep ditches in there that make it very difficult to maintain with our tractors as we're uh, roadside mowing. And, and again, these are through some of the cuts and fills that we did, so the ditches ended up getting steep to be able to fit in that right of way. So uh, from an aesthetic point of view, I think you're gonna get a better final product. Um, it may be something that the county looks back to the, its policy in general and says, you know what, just given all this stuff that's going in the right-of-way these days, a 30-meter right-of-way probably makes more sense. Um, 
in terms of a mitigation, because we're taking or we're required to have more property, they get there's just more compensation provided to the landowner as as the land gets transferred. So it's based on the area that's required, and and the compensation is based on value that we've assessed. So um, they do get you know at the end of the day there is a little bit more in their pocket because of the additional requirement uh, to accommodate the right of way. Councillor Lang. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and through you. And Ben pretty much said what I was going to say. And, and that, that was my point, is that the road is not going to be any wider, the traveled portion. And I even was going to use County Road 19 as an example. <laughs> Holy jumpings. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> if, if you have a house there, I mean, this, 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 even the landscaping is going, it's going to end up being lawn, and it's going to be easier for there's There's places on County Road 19 where the ditch is steep that they can't cut it with the lawnmower. So if they had a wider and it was a little gradual, they would be able to cut it right to the road. It would make their lot look bigger and, and, and better. I, I don't think it's going to change very much. And, and if it's not needed, I, I wouldn't worry too much about the farmers. They're going to creep out there anyway. <laughs> Any other questions for Mr. DeHaan or Mr. Jans about this, uh, the right of way and the, the thoughts of council about approving that they go ahead and consider and consider the 30 meter right away. So I think the, uh, the general feeling is you have direction on that. Thank you. Uh, great, and, and I guess uh, part two of this is, is something that really s uh, flows into our next uh, discussion item, but uh, we are, uh, right now, as, as we continue to progress with this design and this project, uh, it's, it's becoming more and more apparent that it, financially it may be very, very difficult for us to accomplish this next year. What we're looking for Council's support on on this one as well is uh, so we're suggesting that we either uh, defer the work altogether for 2023 or the alternative, which I have a suspicion uh, council may be more um, uh, may have a greater appetite for is look to try and phase the work in a way that actually you know we do get to start next year but also gives us what our budget our comp entire budget is uh, and allows us to phase that work over two budget seasons which will again lessen the impact to our taxpayers because uh, as it stands right now we're carrying an eight million dollar um, budget for this project we do have money from uh, the um, the Nation Rise Wind Farm um, Road Users uh, Agreement. That was the compensation to the county for the uh, deterioration. And the last council put that into reserve for this project. We have been saving up over the past, I want to say, three years at this point, uh, putting away approximately half a million dollars a year, which we are also spending on design and spending on some of the, uh, the, the work that's necessary to get this work done. So we do have some reserve saved up. Uh, but the reality is, as we kind of get these budget down to the final strokes, we're, uh, it's, a, it's a real challenge to fit this one in this year. So our thought from, from the staff level is that there's a bunch of reasons why it makes sense. And perhaps we look at a, a late season tender uh, where the contractor can start some of the work, some of the ditch relocating. By that, if we do that, then we know what the overall budget is. Uh, we can make sure we have included that in the 2024 budget, gives us more options in terms of what we need to do to be able to fund it. Uh, on top of the reserves, we put them as much again away as we can this year uh, and really just keep our eye on making sure we're done this project in 2024. And, uh, and the other advantage to that uh, approach is that the contractor, if they start it next year, then they know they've got a big project available in 2024. So we may see better, better price or some uh, favorable pricing as contractors are finishing up 2023 work. They can kind of come in and start doing some work and then know that they've got a big good project available and, and secured for 2024. So that's what our suggestion is. And the other part of it too is it does, it, there's a lot of pressure in terms of the municipal drain relocation work and the, um, the property acquisitions. Uh, so to, you know, direction we just got from council is very helpful for us to continue to move that forward. But it also takes a little bit of pressure off of those uh, timelines and those challenges too, because there is you know, that prescribed process we do have to follow. And, uh, and as, as we kind of continue to project out and look ahead, it's, we're, we're very quickly realizing we're running out of time and, and all of these things are fitting together to tell us, you know what, let's, you know, if we take, not, not, again, I don't want to make it seem like we're trying to take our time with it, let's, let's do this right um, and 
right, I think, in this circumstance means let's phase this over a two year, uh, over two years, or if council even prefers, look to 2024. So that's what the second part of this uh, report is, and look to council's feedback on that opportunity. Thank you. So council's feedback on that opportunity, I'm going to start off, and I know I shouldn't, but I'm going to start off. I just want to ask a question, Mr. Dahan. When we think of the, the phasing in of the two seasons and the effect to the community, is it mitigated because the, the initial work takes place outside of the roadway, so it's really not going to affect commuter traffic for the first season? Uh, well, I think you're, you're going to have some lane closures as they're doing that work. For example, the widenings and the, the municipal drain uh, relocations. So you will have some, you know, probably flagging or, or lights to get through the construction zone, but, but, but it will remain open. Like, it, it'll still be an open project. So, okay. um, cool. thanks. If I could add, there are a couple of large culverts on this stretch of road. Uh, at least one of them is called up for replacement as part of this project, so that would be a, a short duration uh, closure. Uh, or in the case of, of uh, if they do have the material, perhaps they could uh, they could try and, and stage something uh, there for a, for a replacement. Uh, considering keeping one one lane open, I guess that remains to be seen. But um, uh, in the worst case scenario, they could have a, a, a one one or two week period where they may not. That, that section of road may not be traversable from one end to the other uh, while they're doing that work. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess I'll, I'll open up at this point. They're looking for direction, fellow councillors. Thoughts? Councillor Williams. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, <clears throat> I think it's important to get this project off the ground. So starting in 2023, I think is important. Uh, there's been a long wait to already, um, and people are anxious to see some some movement. So that's that's just my my take on it. I think if Francois was here, he'd pr probably say the same. Um, yeah. So putting it off is probably not a good idea. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Dentrum. Yeah, I just I want to reiterate. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. I want to reiterate. Uh, uh, Councillor Williams' thoughts there. I, I do think that the community, we've talked about this for quite a while now and we want to see some action happening. Um, again, I think if some of the messaging that uh, came out in our discussion here with respect to the fact that this may make some people's lives easier, I don't know whether those discussions happened at the public uh, input, but, uh, uh, but again, I think then uh, hopefully people will start looking forward to, to seeing this getting, uh, getting finished. So yeah, I, I support that. Anything further to add to that? So you have your direction. I know it's lunchtime, Mr. Jans, but not yet. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so I'm going to, uh, I'll try and be as brief as I possibly can, and I, I was trying to think of a good analogy of what this is like for council, and I, the best one I could come up with is that, you know, I guess I'm, I'm giving you a flashlight into a dark room, so you get to see little bits and pieces of things, but perhaps, you know, you're not seeing the full picture, and I'm, I'm cognizant of that, um, and really, that, and that's okay from my perspective, because what I'm looking for from council here is, as we shine the flashlight on a couple things, if there's anything that council really doesn't like or wants to see uh, a, a clear picture of, then please give me that input because uh, putting together our budget for our department is quite a quite a task. Uh, there's a lot of things that get input into it, and um, <coughs> as we start the actual budget discussions in February, if there are things that council really wants some more detailed information on, uh, can be challenging for for staff to be able to have that at the tips at our fingertips. So if there's things that council really, really are interested to see or want more information on, I can make sure that that's ready to go for council at our February meeting. So again, we're not, uh, you know, not necessarily looking for, um, not necessarily looking for explicit direction in terms of this project in, this project out, but rather if there are things that council wants more information on or wants to have further discussion on, or, you know, I, I can take that direction too. Uh, this project in, this project out. So uh, that's really what, uh, I 
kind of said what I need to say here. Uh, we are, as Council is probably aware, and if you've started your local discussions, uh, there are some du dual challenges uh, all municipalities are, are facing. We've got high inflation, which we have to pay for in our contracts as we get our work done, and frozen property assessments, which uh, help to uh, offset some of those inflationary pressures that we uh, typically, you know, help helped under normal circumstances to deal with those inflationary pressures. Um, so, uh, first thing to talk about with Council is resurfacing, and we did have a good discussion on resurfacing at our last meeting. Uh, so the 2023 program is based on the four-year resurfacing plan that we did look at with Council. Uh, very quickly, this is our estimated costs and locations, so we're at approximately $10.7 million or $10.8 million in resurfacing, which is in line with uh, typical years of resurfacing work. Uh, we do feel that our numbers as uh, presented are a good, um, a, a good reflection of the market as it is today. I like to always caution Council, uh, just to cover our own respective butts, that you know, this is subject to AC adjustment, asphalt cement adjustment pricing. So if we continue to have wild fluctuations in the oil market, uh, we do end up paying more. There are certain circumstances where the market goes down and we are on the receiving end of that. And so it's fair. It's, it's a very fair way to tender. Um, last year was a very, very challenging year for us for AC adjustments. We were about at $1.5 million that we had to pay in addition to our contract because of AC adjustments. Again, all calculated uh, through, uh, through a formula, an accepted industry formula. Uh, but that, of course, you know, we've got our budgets based on today's market. Who knows what happens in July? Um, uh, the resurface, like I said, it's, uh, it's consistent with our proposed four-year plan uh, included in our resurfacing budget as well. So on top of the 10.7 that I just, uh, or 10.8 I just provided to Council, we have some skin patching and that's a typical thing that we do. We budget $100,000, $200,000 in miscellaneous skin patching. What we're looking for is areas where we've seen some deterioration through the winter time or areas where we know we have a lot of uh, pressure to patch and whatnot and that's our way of kind of band-aiding that until we get to the point where we're, we're, we are resurfacing it uh, with, with a more comprehensive job. And we do have proposed a million dollars in microsurfacing as well this year. We're able to, fortunately, it's a, it's a good thing. Fortunately, we've really caught up with our crack sealing program. So we're well ahead of crack sealing in terms of where we typically like to be. Uh, but we do have more areas of microsurfacing that we want to uh, address. And those locations where we're proposing to microsurface are provided in the council report that uh, counties are that that are here and I'll include that in my budget document as well and if there's any questions on any as I go through these sections please by all means I guess you know with at the uh, if, if the warden's okay with that like I'm happy to stop as, as we continue on uh, when we talk about road specific projects uh, County Road 18 embankment repair this is just west of St. Andrews West right near where we were doing our bridge work last year we have an embankment that's kind of slowly subsiding down it's something that's been on the books for a while for us and it just we have a issue with property acquisition we do have to buy a little bit of the toe of slope at the bottom to be able to accommodate the work we want to do Last year, we had hoped to try and uh, get this done as the bridge project right adjacent to this was getting completed and the timing just didn't work out. Uh, so we do have it on the books again for 2023. Uh, we've already uh, budgeted for it and put the money away in reserve. So it's not an actual uh, tax that we need. We've already taxed for this project. It's just getting it done, but it does get included in our, our road projects. Uh, Alexandria detailed design so we're continuing on with our detailed design work in Alexandria and includes and I, I mentioned this before but we do want to get out there into the public and kind of give those updates this year uh, I've already spoken with uh, some of the local papers about that and and we are uh, in communication with uh, North Glengarry staff and, and we do want to continue to get that out and make sure that that's on the forefront. Uh, I do want to note, I think it's in the microsurfacing locations. We are microsurfacing some of these areas through uh, Main Street and Alexandria too because they are in pretty deteriorated shape. And the reality, and I guess what County Road 22 teaches us, is that big projects like this, as much as we'd like to say we can get to it right away, it's going to take some time. And uh, Main Street is in a shape where it needs a little bit of TLC, so we do want to smooth it out for the next little bit, and that just buys us that, uh, that time to be able to fund for it. If I could hold you up there, uh, yep. Mr. Dahan, Councillor Williams. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, I'm, I'm really glad to hear about the microsurfacing on... Uh, through the main street in Alexandria, the, the residents have been yep. going mad 
and staff are, are really been having troubles explaining the situation. So, but w will that microsurfacing, how much will it improve that rideable surface? So we're proposing to put two lifts of microsurfacing down, which is uh, two half inch uh, layers. And so uh, the first lift will uh, go a long way to uh, filling in any rutting. And, uh, and, and if there's any uh, uneven uh, cracking where, where one side is lifting up, uh, that will help to smooth that out. And then the, the second lift will, will come over and, um, and, and hopefully, uh, you know, bridge anything that's, that's still outstanding. So uh, it, it will go a long ways to smoothing it uh, in, the, in the short term. Uh, however, the, the asphalt underneath that's cracked up will continue to move. And so we will expect that, um, that, that smooth surface to crack fairly quickly and, and continue to move as the asphalt under it moves. Uh, it, it will be forced to uplift or rut or whatever's going on. So it is uh, so solely a short-term holding strategy to just to try and improve the situation in the short term, uh, and it will probably be rough again by the time we actually get in there. Well, th but th Mr. Warden, if I may, but that's good. I mean, uh, you know, it, it's, 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 it's a whole lot better than nothing. It's a, it's a low-cost Band-Aid, yeah. and that's exactly what <laughs> the intention is here. It's and, a low-cost Band-Aid. And, and when will the, when, when is the proposed uh, starting time of not the microsurfacing, but the actual project? Um, th that, that's probably a bigger discussion okay. than, than this. It's, All right, fair enough. Well, I think it's fair to say not 2023, and then we can, we can go further at some okay. other point. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, continuing Continue. on with ro road projects, uh, we did talk about County Road 22, so I won't uh, spend any time on that. Uh, the other thing that we did include in our budget is traffic signal replacement on uh, 3443 in Alexandria. There was some definish deficiencies in finishing work that were uh, necessary there. You wouldn't know it uh, when you're out there and, and we're, we're having continued dialogues with the contractor. That all being said, it is from reserves, so it's again not, not something that's actually um, that we have to tax for. It is something we have saved up uh, just based on the overall project costs uh, that will be resolved next year. Uh, in, uh, in terms of other big road projects, this is a screenshot from uh, underneath the road in Williamstown. And if you look to our four-year resurfacing plan, you'll be able to see that I think it's 2025. And I'm sorry, I'm going off of my memory. 2025, we're doing some paving in Williamstown um, over top of this. And we shouldn't pave over top of this until this is fixed. So we're recommending in 2023 that we go in, uh, do a culvert lining, uh, or excuse me, a storm sewer lining, clean this up so that it's uh, in a good shape before we actually do the paving. Again, good practice that we uh, typically try and do based on CCTV work and when we know we're going to be over top of uh, critical infrastructure or critically deteriorated infrastructure like this. And I should say, like, you know, there's no, this is not going to collapse tomorrow. There's no, this is, this is in bad shape, but I can, I can show you worse if council's interested in seeing worse. Um, other road projects, uh, this was, uh, Kenner 22 at Dead Man's Curve is a project we talked about with the previous council. I don't think it's come up at this council, uh, but it's a project that we are working in collaboration with a developer on, and the direction we received from the previous council was to include this project in our 2023 budget. Essentially what it is, is that the developer is looking to uh, develop a multi-residential uh, type of development just to the west of where Dead Man's Curve is, uh, because of that, there are some challenges with being able to have the appropriate sight lines to access County Road 2. Uh, there are ways to mitigate that. This is, you know, this screenshot from Google of what it looks like today. Um, so the, the sight lines are not great there. But what we're proposing to do is not only just to help this, this is not a help the developer, but rather help the sight lines there, uh, working with the developer, is uh, install a retaining wall. So actually re install a retaining wall that pushes the curve back enough that people can adequately see as they approach the intersection on County Road 2, and it also helps people leaving that development. Uh, the proposal that uh, the previous council had supported was that the county would pay the cost difference of um, one of the ways we could, sorry, I'm backing up a little bit. One of the ways the developer could allow access into their property is by providing a, uh, essentially like a merge lane. So if you were, if you were turning, they, that they provide essentially a lane beside the active lanes of County Road 2 so that turn, then you can merge into traffic safely. Uh, if needed and as needed. Um, 
So what uh, council had supported was the developer put that cost into the retaining wall kind of ultimate solution and the county pay the difference between the two. So right now our estimate for that is about $300,000. And, and that's something at budget time council can discuss whether they're still comfortable uh, with that approach. But uh, from, you know, from the direction we received from last council, that was, uh, that was it seemed to be a fair way to, uh, to approach this project. On the bridge project side of things, again, Mike spent a lot of time at our last meeting talking about some of the bridge needs that we have. So uh, very, very quickly show the uh, bridge projects we have. Now, fortunately, with the direction we, we received from council today, we can amend our South Nation River Bridge uh, budget that we've submitted uh, to recognize the savings from a full closure. So that will be reflected appropriately in the, in the document that council gets um, for budget. Uh, looking at equipment and shop improvements across uh, the uh, across our department, uh, we are proposing a tandem snowplow, which we've already tendered for, have the approval for. It's just making sure we pay, and we're going to do the same thing again this year, where we tender for the 2024 snowplow at some point in the next upcoming months to make sure that it does get delivered in time for 2024. Um, we, as part of our 10-year replacement equipment <coughs> replacement plan, which council. I'll provide a, a copy of it shows kind of the fleet that we have and how we're replacing it over certain periods depending on the type of equipment the use it has uh, we're looking at uh, several half ton pickups uh, three quarter ton pickups one ton pickups uh, disc mowers uh, we are also proposing uh, for the forestry department a forestry ATV to help with some of the work that's taking place in that department it would be owned by transportation services but then charged out to forestry so it's just an internal kind of accounting that that we would do. And the last thing uh, that um, we have approved in, uh, and the previous council gave us approval to proceed with getting paid through municipal modernization funding is a street sweeper, which will be a county owned street sweeper, but the intention is to use it to do street sweeping county and local uh, street sweeping. So uh, a great collaboration opportunity between uh, county and local municipalities. Um, ben, Councillor Lang. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and through you. Uh, the street, street waiver, will it be available for this uh, season, for the, like, shortly after spring? Because last year I know we had lots and lots of complaints because we were not able to get anybody on time. Yeah, we were fortunate enough, and I don't think we've heard anything different, but we're expecting an early spring delivery for that unit, so it'll be here right in time for, for this year. Um, the other equipment and shop improvements, uh, this is a picture I took Friday at Winchester Springs. So we do have, uh, and you know, I hate to say it, it's, you know, with these types of facilities, you do have to have regular replacement of those tarps. We knew this one was coming to the end of its life. And unfortunately, just with some of the high winds we've had and we could see the tears up at the top, we knew it was coming and it, it has now failed, but we are intending to replace the tarps at Winchester Springs. And I think that's the last uh, ones we have to replace since we originally built them. We've replaced the tarps at all the other facilities. So our final, our final replacement and you know, part of the life cycle cost of managing these facilities. Um, and then other shop repairs and updates, uh, things as you know, improved windows and doors, uh, some of those uh, ideas that um, just to keep our shops in good shape and, and try and create some you know better efficiencies, energy efficiencies, things like that. Um, last thing um, that excuse me, Ben, oh, sorry. Uh, to interrupt you, Councillor McGillis. Well, thank you, Mr. Warden. As you know, Ben, years ago I wasn't a big strong proponent for those type of facilities uh, for our storing our salt, but that's what we chose at the time. How long has have the uh, roofs last? over the years now that this one has to be repaired how long has that roof been uh, you know since the day it was built I think we we are at like a 12 a 13 to this is now coming on 15 years so 13 to 15 years and that's more or less in line with what we had have, have understood from the industry for those tar tarps one of the things we and I'm sorry Derek I'm kind of putting you on the spot and maybe you know you don't We've looked to a, more, a better UV treatment, or there was something that changed in the original design of those tarps versus what's available on the market now, and I want to say that it has a better, you know, it's, it's better at resisting UV degradation. Does, 
Yeah, so, and I'm putting on, I'm unfairly putting Derek on the spot here, so, uh, but there was something a little bit changed with the spec of those tarps, which we are hoping to see a, a longer lasting tarp. But, uh, and, and actually it's a good uh, segue to this, uh, this slide, because one of the things we have done, um, and I'm gonna look at our Director of Financial Services, we've been putting away money into reserve to replace not only the tarps, but also the, uh, the facilities themselves, and, and generally speaking, we're targeting um, you know close to two hundred thousand dollars a year, just putting a little bit of money away every year. Uh, I've reduced the amount this year based on our cost to replace the tarp because it's just part. You know, it's I could do the full thing and then pull out to do the tarps. It's six half a dozen, uh, but we have been actually putting money away in reserves to be able to more proactively kind of stay on top of replacement of tarps and not have to do. You know, all four facilities or two facilities in one year, one facility in one year, maybe just a little more. You know, oh, we see a tear, we can just replace one of the one of the sections. So, that's that's been our strategy with putting away this kind of money, and and we want to continue doing that. Uh, other reserves. Uh, sorry, maybe I'll I'll pause there to make sure I've answered uh, Councillor McGillis's question. Councillor McGillis, anything further? Go ahead, Mr. Don. Good, thank you. Uh, the other reserves that uh, we're, we've included in our draft budget is our equipment reserve. We are putting away $100,000. Again, when you have a look at the 10-year replacement plan, you'll see how the ins and outs of our replacement plan, you know, this is a year we need to put money in because, you know, five, six years down the road, we're going to have to start pulling money out of our equipment replacement reserve uh, to be able to offset some of the larger costs that we have in front of us. And lastly, we have proposed a resurfacing reserve transaction. So putting $308,000 back into our resurfacing reserve um, from the money we are expecting to pull out of it. And that of course is subject to how the year end shakes out. And I know our director is doing her best to try and balance things out without needing to use reserves to the greatest extent possible. So this, is, this may be an area for savings depending on how we do uh, once all the year end numbers are crunched. And with that, that's kind of a very quick look with the flashlight at what you're gonna, what we're gonna be talking about in February. Thank you, Mr. Han, for that, <clears throat> that uh, quick overview. Uh, questions, comments from members of council. I think we've had the opportunity to ask to interject in the middle, in the, during the presentation, but. Uh, to council, uh, my comment is we've received information from Mr. Hahn uh, to speed the process along. Please do his bidding and uh, get the information to him so that uh, whenever the next time we meet and discuss these topics, we're able to discuss them uh, not so much quickly, but not think of them right then and there and allow Mr. Dehan, Mr. Jans, and Derek to prepare the uh, to pre prepare the information that we'll need to make good decisions. So I, I urge everyone to uh, to think long and hard about some of the challenges we face and uh, reach out to uh, to the director. Uh, Councillor Williams. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Just a quick question <clears throat> for the benefit of the some of the new members around the table. When will we be having a discussion on now need roads? Um, last year was, if, if I may, through you, Mr. Warden, last year was our kind of first year with that policy in place. My suggestion or my thought on that is probably after budget because really that's something that's like, we'll call it the bonus. Um, depending on how the year end shakes out. And um, so I'm thinking it's probably after budget. I'm kind of looking, looking to my colleagues to make sure I'm not uh, speaking out of turn. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's based on year end surplus and, and just for the benefit of council that hasn't been around. Um, any surplus funds that uh, that are available at year end, it goes into what is called the now needs road reserve, and then council has the opportunity to consider the now needs roads that they have ahead of them, which are not included in the four year resurfacing plan, and make a decision whether they want to uh, address one or more roads in any given year. You, uh, council has full discretion at that, and uh, so we really only get to that point. It's kind of a, it's something that can happen outside of budget. It's not necessarily included in budget, uh, so it, it'll happen in my thought process, a little bit outside of budget.
So notice, no, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Hahn, Mr. Jans. Motions, notice the motions, nothing. Petitions, nothing. Miscellaneous business. Before Mr. Dahan gets up, I do I, I, I must admit I, uh, I missed something earlier when I talked about the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus. Mr. Dahan's name came up at that meeting, and uh, I just want to say kudos to you, Mr. Dahan, for keeping SDG on the map. Your name was talked with great reverence. It was spoken with great reverence uh, to uh, to your uh, contribution to the uh, the one stop. Please. One window permitting process, and uh, again, uh, thank you for representing us in such a wonderful fashion. Um, also, as you walk away, <laughs> oh, I just wanted to make uh, mention to uh, my fellow councillors that uh, they use a picture d describing the ease of transporting that transformer uh, into the city of Ottawa. As, uh, as one of the uh, benefits of the uh, one window permitting process and how easy that whole thing uh, trans took place. And uh, again, I was quite proud that SDG was uh, highlighted in that fashion. Thank you. I think at this point, if there's nothing else, we'll move into closed session. It's moved by Councillor Lang, seconded by Councillor Guindal, that Council proceed in camera pursuant to Section 239-2C of the Municipal Act 2001, a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board, forest property acquisition. All those in favor?
Seconded by Councillor Densham that Council rise and reconvene without reporting. All those in favor? Opposed, seeing none, that's carried. Madam Clerk, the ratification bylaw. It's moved by Councillor Broad, seconded by Councillor Lang, that bylaw number 5384, being a bylaw to adopt, confirm, and ratify matters dealt with by resolution, be read and passed in open council, signed and sealed. All those in favor? Opposed, seeing none. And before we uh, move to adjournment, uh, I just want to invite all of everyone that's in the room to have some birthday cake. So, adjournment by resolution, Madam Clerk. It's moved by Councillor Lang, seconded by Councillor Gaindal, that Council adjourn to the call of the Chair. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none. Meeting adjourned.